Oh, you're... I had last minute technical difficulties here. Wow, that was scary. Okay, well, we got the stream going anyway. So hang out while I... Uh, oh, welcome to Iron Show Live! All right. Hey, let me get the boys in here. We get the stream going here. You're listening to the Iron Show. It's Thursday night. About three minutes late. Oh, now four. Hang on while I dial everything in here. Sorry, everybody. Live radio. in here get things going oh yeah oh yeah wouldn't you know that wouldn't you know it, this is when skype wants to update oh, yeah. Okay, we're getting my rabbi Mike here. Oh yeah, let's hook him up here. <laughs> oh yeah. Oh. oh no, last minute technical difficulties. Oh dear. Oh rabbi Mike. <laughs> I can't believe this. Okay. Well, we're going. We're five minutes, six minutes late, but we're actually live now. So say something stupid. Something stupid. There you go. <laughs> I knew you were going to say that. <laughs> While I bring in an additional guest to the group here. And yes, guess who we got here? We got. We got. Who is this? Sounds like. Looks like we've got. Oh, yeah! Oops, it dropped. <laughs> okay. Wait, a bit Wait a minute. See, my secondary machine has also failed, so I'm there. I'm in manually. Okay, we've got we've got another special guest here tonight with us. We're dialing him up. He's probably gonna answer and go, huh? Hello? Can you hear me? Hello? Can you hear me? Hey, what's Don't up? Don't say that. <laughs> oh yeah! Oh yeah! Oh, yeah! Oh yeah! We're late. I had last minute brutal technical difficulties. My first machine, my primary machine would not fire up. And then I came up with all these issues. And I was like, no! No, I'm feverishly working. I get the stream going at three minutes after seven. Now I'm finally getting hold of both of you here. We have uh, a very special guest with us today. Guess who I got? Look what I got. Look who I got. Counselor Mark. Can you hear me? <gasps> oh yeah! Oh yeah! <laughs> no, seriously, can you hear me? <laughs> My stuff isn't working. We don't say that on the Iron Show. <laughs> yeah, we hear you fine. Ah <laughs> yeah! Because it's not chilling up right. So. <laughs> I don't know what to say. <laughs> Wait a minute here, the, I'm working off my primary machine and uh, let's see if I got let's see if I got anything over here. No? Oh, where we come on, where is that? Here we go, come on, secondary uh, machine, wait. Uh, oh yeah, we are! Oh yeah. 
<laughs> okay, okay, we're good. We're gold. <laughs> Welcome everyone <laughs> to Iron Show Live! Oh yeah! And we are Hello, here. We're, we're, we're making Ellie Marzuli look, you know, <laughs> professional by comparison. We're doing something wrong. Vibrate it. Oh yeah! Oh, now Mark's got his sound effects. So, Counselor Mark, give me a what's up. Come on, baby. Alrighty. Alrighty. Hang on a sec. Oh, oh, dude! Oh, yeah! Oh, yeah! Oh, that was so nice. I just love it when you speak like that to me. I know. I'm it's so forever. good. Oh, yeah! Oh, yeah! yeah! All right, hey. I need to get like that, you know, Danzig sort of. Okay. <laughs> Everybody says I get mine from King Diamond. Diamond. Yeah, do you know who King Diamond was? Oh, I know who King Diamond was, believe me. Yeah. Oh, I... Freak <laughs> on wheels. <laughs> this sounds a little bit like King Diamond. I never heard much of him. Ooh, a little too much rainbow music there. Oh, his. Uh... Felix. King Diamond is a freaky looking dude. Oh my gosh. Really? I've never That's heard him so or seen him. Looking. Oh, just look up one of his music videos, man. It's unbelievable. That yep. guy is strange. Really? He really is. Man, I keep pegging out. Does it No, you're good here. Don't don't okay. worry about that. Right. You're I like won't touch it. I'll you're just deal solid with the gold. pegging out. Don't touch it! Don't touch I'm it! A don't it. I'm a rock break it. Why should I have problems with Pegging something out, right? <laughs> it's like I'm, I'm only gonna make this, I'm gonna make this meter go to eleven. <laughs> that's that. Yeah. <laughs> you know what's wrong? Oh yeah! Oh yeah! I'm done now. I can't no, that was. Do a... <laughs> oh, don't be done yet. <laughs> 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 Oh, that's so funny. <laughs> oh, yeah. Just wanted to say that we are live and we are in your ear. Right, live on a Thursday night, 7, 7 11 actually on the West Coast tonight. <laughs> Which actually what time? What's that? <laughs> Which actually yeah. Yeah, Pacific time. Which is actually kind of funny because um since it's seven eleven on the West Coast it's kind of uh it's like coincidental I guess. Or maybe it was meant to be I am sitting next to a half cold uh container of seven eleven nachos with jalapenos. Oh. And cheese sauce. <laughs> you're living like a you're living like a king up in that trailer. I, <laughs> oh my gosh! Oh, I like it when you say that. Oh yeah! <laughs> All right, hey. Tonight. He dresses like Prince, but he lives like a king. <laughs> oh. You this have a cheesy mustache like going on, Johnny. When the doves cry. Yeah, yeah. Do, do, do. How can you leave me standing alone in the world? Alone it's, so the world. it's so cold. Maybe I'm just, Maybe I'm just, just a stupid man. 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 <laughs> I want to do that as Elmer Fudd so bad. <laughs> do it, do it, do it. I really do. I got to get my head in the right space here. You got to give me a second. Uh, okay, uh, let's see here. Let get, uh, Elmer Fudd going. Um, be very, very quiet. How could you just leave me standing? All I can do is Homestar Runner. Honestly, I can do Homestar Runner doing it. If anybody out there knows who Homestar Runner is. I don't know. How that. could you leave me standing alone in a world so cold? <laughs> 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 hey, so good. 
So, yeah. I can't get Elmer Fudd going on, man. Maybe later. You know, I, going back to the... I can't the, get my Fudd going on, man. Well, is that crazy lab? Going, going into the Prince back catalog is always a good time. So uh, Yeah, that's always good stuff. It's always good stuff. Yeah, ever since he decided to get in a cult, he doesn't sing any of those songs anymore. It's kind of disappointing. What cult is he in? Like the, the uh, um, completely Jehovah, unmentionable... He's in Jehovah's Witness. Oh, man, I just had a friend get out of that. <laughs> hey, right. man, I like to hear that. Yep, uh, <sighs> she got into it back uh, when we were in our college years and uh, eventually saw the light. And I'm not 100% sure where she's standing on faith at the moment. She clearly believes in God. She's just not 100% sure she's got it figured out, which, you know, hey, approaching it humbly is a good thing. Yeah, um, I mean, did to convince her, did you put her like in a burlap sack and beat her? Those, I can't take the credit stick? on that one. I, I just oh, sort of, okay. it, it's like there were, she was uh, traveling in Japan and that kind of bit. And um, I think that uh, when she went through a divorce, uh, that's when the blinders started coming off or whatever. And mm -hmm. she's, um, we're actually hoping to get back together because I've not, she didn't, because I had a Jewish wedding, she was told by <laughs> the people in her cult that she wasn't allowed to come. And she's always regretted that. So uh, our plan right now is to, hey, you need to come over and meet my family finally. So we're going to. Yeah, no kidding. A Jewish wedding. Forbidden. Yeah. That's weird, man. Well, because it's some weird, you know, non-religious non thing that the Watchtower can't, just can't handle. I mean, you know, if they uh, found out there were other people actually keeping God's commandments, it, you know, might actually cause <laughs> people to go, whoa, you know, I it? don't know. I, I, Jehovah's Witnesses aren't the only thing here. Uh, you know. was, was her uh, previous husband, was the Jehovah's Witness? The thing is, I always thought that that was the case, um, but apparently he wasn't, and it was actually stress over her being in the cult that ultimately destroyed the marriage, if I'm understanding wow. the situation wow. correctly. So, I, I, I'm not, she was like raised Catholic, and I think, and my, what I understand is that her uh, husband asked questions that her Catholicism just wasn't prepared to answer, and, right. but unfortunately, instead of, you know, doing the normal thing and becoming evangelical or something like that, she uh, went and she uh, got caught up in the Jehovah's Witnesses and it went from there. So. That's sad. I've totally hijacked your show now, Johnny. No, no, no. I was just going to say, I've been, take, <laughs> I've been taking lessons. Taking lessons. <laughs> I've been listening taking lessons. Very closely. I like what you do here. Suddenly, I keep, that's scary. I've been keeping my ear to the ground. And, oh, uh, man. Lately. Wow. And I've just... I've, I feel bad for Jehovah's Witness people, you know, because... Uh, well, you know what the Jehovah's Witness Christmas Carol is, right? Uh, no, no hell, what? no hell, no hell, <laughs> no, no hell. hell. Oh, it's <laughs> so happy yeah, that there's only soul death. Yeah, it's, of course, and they're not going to sing a Christmas Carol because they don't celebrate that stuff. I'm, I'm actually, I'm one of those, I'm one of those guys though. So careful. What? Oh, I'm one of the very rare uh, Baptistical Catholics who embraces. Um, annihilationism. Really? Yes, I do. I didn't know that about you. When did that happened? Did not know that. Always have been. Always have been. So, okay, so start at the beginning of that statement. You were a <laughs> Baptocostal Catholic. <laughs> Baptocostal Catholic. A, a what? A Baptocostal Catholic. Baptocostal Catholic yes, who, who believes in annihilation. Yeah, annihilationism. Yeah. I guess that whatever lets you sleep better at night. <laughs> it doesn't let me sleep better at night. Yeah, because uh, uh, okay. <laughs> I'm, I'm sitting here. I'm kind of like, hmm, annihilation. You know, I, I wish it's kind of like I wish there was annihilation the same way that I wish there wasn't hell. Yeah. You know what I mean? I wish I wish I could talk to people and go, hey, you can be a follower of Jesus. Or you can burn for eternity. I'm sorry. Uh, you know, but being a Christian is awesome. So I dig that. But uh, I didn't. How how long have you been an annihilationist? And I didn't know this. Always. When did you come out of the closet? Always. I've said that. <laughs> always. I've said, always said that on the Aaron Show. Ask Rabbi Mike. Right, Rabbi Mike? Oh, no, he's consistent I'd, about that. What? Unfortunately. <laughs> I'd, I'd have to listen to the show to even know this stuff. I. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> that's, yeah. That kind of. Oh, can you feel a burn? <laughs> oh, Does dude, burn? man, it's Does like it a road. You want yeah. some more, dude, man? It's like a street pizza. Oh, it's a road oh, rash. He's wasted and he's yeah. on his face in the gutter. <laughs> you got a road rash on my ass. 
<laughs> oh, dude, I'm writing a song right now. It's a rock instrumental for this uh, benefit album I'm doing. Called Road Rash? Uh, Road Rash is one of my absolute favorite video games, and Road Rash 2 especially. And so I found I should email you the link to just this little itty-bitty bit I got done, and you can play it if you want to. It's just this horrible sounding. It's almost like 16-bit, just like the game was, drums. <laughs> and and uh, and uh, just and it's just this little guitar part. I'm going to email you that, Johnny, and if you want to play it, you can. But uh, I'm purposely writing a song based on my love of the game Road Rash. I love that. As I've always said, if you can be in a video game where you can run a motorcycle at 180 miles an hour and beat up cops, it's just... Of course, now that's extremely not nice to say. So beat up other bad guys with pipes and chains. Uh, the, I think Ice T already beat you to it about thirty years ago. Yeah, so yeah, 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 but not like, like Road that. Rash. Yeah, no, Road Rash. I like the beat though. That you're. It's like you know where there oh, really that, is. I'm beatboxing. I'm beatboxing. Do right that beat. Right old show. No, it's not. Yeah, that's I'm not it. It was no. You had like a. You had like a um a swing beat going at two twelve. I, yeah, I don't know how to do heavy metal. It's like a heavy metal swing beat at two twelve. You know, I used to I used to do that back in the eighties. Everybody polka. I get out my yeah. I get. I don't know how to beatbox a double kick. Just a, a horrible double kick bass. So I don't know. Uh, I used to get out I'm my. Sending you, I'm the, sending you the song right now, though, and like I said, you can do what you want with it. I just think it's cheesy. Is is just really funny that way. Where is that thing? Where yeah, send it. Message? We'll play it on the break. Oh, there you go. <laughs> anything but anything but listen to you prattle on for hours. I, yeah. <laughs> Who else is on this <laughs> show? <laughs> no, I used to have a Casio that I turned the swing beat up to 212 and jammed out <laughs> heavy metal back in the 80s. It oh, was just man. like that, dude. It's a total. You take like the salt, not the salsa, but the swing beat, and you like take push it up to 212 and the, just <laughs> <Casanova>. jam <laughs> yeah but it, no it's heavy metal it's like a double kick heavy metal at 212 oh my gosh yeah <laughs> yeah so like That's the hilarious. needle li- the I needle lies you know and you know the needle what, lies don't you know that heavy metals of the devil what's wrong oh, with you the devil. yes it's one of the fruits of yeah. the devil <laughs> You got some fruits on the show, that's for sure. That show, that's from the movie So I Married an Axe Murderer, and he was describing <laughs> one of the girls that he was going out with, and he something about Satan, and he was like, oh my gosh, is that like the fruits of the devil? <laughs> You know, some, there's some poor sap that's just been, you know, that was told by his friend, you know, you gotta listen to Aaron show, man. It's really, really godly. And he just came on. <laughs> and it's like, <laughs> oh my gosh. The well, you know, disappointment must be palpable. Nah, once you get past <laughs> the info, we get intro. <laughs> once you get past the info, once you get past the intro, yeah, we, the get, <laughs> we get rocking. Yeah, I mean, no we get rocking. We get. <laughs> We get deep. We get profound. I mean, come on, give me a break. Yeah, you know. Yeah, that's true. Once uh, yeah. the intro is the fun. This is when we actually try to build rapport with anybody who's dropping in. And <laughs> yeah, stuff like Stay that. You know. <laughs> Hi, how you doing? Welcome to Coffee Talk. <laughs> oh, man, oh we could, or we could just do it exactly. <laughs> we could do it like the view. Yeah. <laughs> hey, you you could be the black chick. <laughs> there is an episode. There is an episode. There's an episode of I think it's Futurama, where uh, Fry tries to throw these pictures he's got of Whoopi Goldberg in a bottomless pit, and the pit throws him back out. <laughs> Oh my gosh. Oh, where's my music? Oh, yeah. That was so funny. Uh, you know how many feminists it takes to screw in a light bulb? Uh, how many? Oh, That's no. not funny. <laughs> oh, yeah. Male chauvinist pig. Oh, uh, Johnny and I can relate to this one. Do you know how many hey, no, lead guitar? Do you know how many? Yeah, we can relate to the feminist. Um, do you know how many lead guitar players it takes to screw in a light bulb? Slap, grab my mic. How many? It takes ten. One to do it, and nine to stand back and say, "Yeah, it was good, but I could have done it better." Yeah. <laughs> 
You know how to get a guitar player to quit playing? No. How? Put the sheet music in front of them. <laughs> here's my last. Here's I've got two more. One is how do you get the bass player off your porch? Ow. Pay for the pizza. <laughs> Pay for the pizza. <laughs> and here's the last one, so I can offend everybody. Um, what do you call that guy who likes to hang out with musicians? Um, what? Drummers. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Who likes to sponge off musicians? It's usually we had to keep drummers alive, usually. Oh, That's yeah. The way that what do you works. call a bass player without a girlfriend? Uh, Homeless. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, yeah, I know all about that. Oh uh, yeah, like there's always somebody in the band. You got to keep the band together, but there's always somebody in the band that won't work. So you have to support oh, them. Right? You got to float that dude. Yeah, you got to float him. Just but, get through your gigs, and it's just awful. Yeah, it's it's awful. It's, it's cool though, because like you're all one big happy family in the band house. So oh yeah, them were the days. I remember that. We, me and my ba- old bass player Lindsay, were reminiscing about that. And, um, we're talking about, he's saying, oh, hey, you know the creative professionals these days take tiny amounts of LSD to enhance their, I guess they get prescriptions for it. It's like 10 mics, which is, so I go, 10 mics, well, how much did like we do back in the day in the band house? So I go looking it up, I went, wow, 150 mics was a normal hit back then. We'd take like three hits, so that we're like 450 mics. <laughs> and we, I said, you remember that one time when you stared at me and you go, this is intense. <laughs> I go, yeah, dude. <laughs> I got six fingers, man. Remember when Mike do with his extra fingers? <laughs> yeah, oh my God. No, I can yeah. play a lot better. <laughs> <laughs> I go, you remember right after that, my girlfriend tried to kill me with a knife. I go, he goes, yeah, 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 yeah. And then she turned into a little kid and sucked my toes. I go, yeah, that made me mad. So anyway, <laughs> that was a bad memory. <laughs> oh yeah, where's my? Oh, yeah! Fantasy children touch oh, my toes. Yeah! What a nice Christian show. Oh, oh yes. Oh. oh, that wasn't too bad, though. It's a true story. Oh, oh yeah! Oh, Counselor Mark is the best ones of those. Oh, I'm so good. And speaking of Counselor Mark here, um, this guy was... Um, this guy was listening to the Iron Show. He's an Iron Show uh, groupie raised on Counselor Mark. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, yeah, Counselor Mark Poor changed. Guy. I know, huh? Counselor Mark oh. totally destroyed his brain like about five years ago or whatever. Anyway, so a while ago, he's, I don't know, a few months ago, three, four months ago, he's riding his lawnmower, his riding mower. Because that's what he does. He, like, takes care of properties. He's, like, he's not Ooh. like a professional lawnmower. He's like a... A professional property caregiver. So I mean, right. this is yeah, one of. Keeps telling you. But yeah, there you go. <laughs> All right. Oh, that was I cool, am man. a real estate engineer. <laughs> I am a dishwashing technician. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, so he's on his lawnmower, and a bolt of lightning comes out of the clouds, and the clouds part, and uh, a beam of light. Uh, shines down on his lawnmower and a voice says, ye shall create your own podcast. All right. So he gets a hold of me. He goes, dude, man, I, I want to start a podcast. And I'm like, oh, wow. How long have you been wanting to do a podcast? He goes, I don't want to do a podcast. <laughs> I was like, okay. <laughs> he goes, <laughs> But I love that. Those are the God, best ones. Please, do a He's like, the Lord is making me. I don't have a choice. Help me. I'm like, okay. So I, I talked to him for several hours and answered all his techie tech questions. Like, uh-huh. how do you do it? And <clears throat> about a week later, he had completely built his own studio. I don't think he slept since the time that I talked to him and then the time when his studio is built. He's got a studio. It's a lot like the Iron Show studio. It's a little bit simpler, but... Um, anyway, he has he um, he wanted to start a ministry, a podcast ministry um, that is reaching out to the um, recovering addicts and the current addicts and anybody else who's having problems, you know, really walking through their daily life. And so he's got four episodes out now. I'd like to introduce Mr. Brandon of Cast Em Off Ministries, the chain breaker himself. What's up? How's it going? Hey, all right. Yeah, that's awesome, dude. 
Because I think God God told me to start my own little show, like I think about 12 years ago, and I was like, mm, no. <laughs> yeah, that's what I was thinking too. That's and, and then, that's and then I somehow messed with you when you do that. Yeah, and my life has sucked since. It's weird. Um, the mower, for one thing, my mower is always broke. Uh, you know, there's, you know, that's where the God stuff, right? And and then, and then, uh, no, I, I, I was. They, who was it? Whoever handled fu uh, Future Quake contacted me and were like, "Oh, you ought to do your own show." When I was on that show, and I was like, "Yeah, okay." Doctor Future. So I did. I did. <laughs> this is what happened, Doctor Future. Yeah. I, <laughs> okay. Hey, dude, yeah, He'll smart. say that to anybody. That guy, though, so Johnny. What was his name? Jimmy? No, Johnny. Oh, yeah, Johnny. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I thought, yeah, I'll do this, and and I had some cool music, and and it wasn't anything like the Iron Show, which is like you know, epic. And so I did the Thank show you. and it was a 30 minute show. It was a good show. And I was going to do it live and take emails, but I did a show and, and, uh, I listened to it and I thought, God, this sucks. I thought it was good. I mean, a total. Well, I mean, I don't think I ever put it out there. If you heard it, then you've got some kind of miracle. You like, sent it to uh, me. No, you sent it to me. Oh, that's right. That's right. And it was called unbound. Yeah. Unbound. The idea yeah. was to deal with people who were, bound yeah <laughs> and so oh, same uh, thing like the chain breaker here like brandon yeah but see that's the thing is is you get an idea and then you pass it on and somebody else takes it and then they can do it and i don't waste my life you know <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah <laughs> running down the dream that i really didn't have <laughs> sounds like you're more like running down the drain to me i don't know running down the drain well yeah. you know <laughs> circling the drain circling the drain <laughs> If I can just voice this arc on somebody else, I'll be okay. <laughs> <laughs> There's probably a sign outside for 25 years that said room to rent. <laughs> <laughs> Council Mark got well, a hold a of me. Fixer upper. <laughs> it's a but, fixer upper. <laughs> but you'll have plenty of room for your pets. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So. You don't even charge yeah. an extra deposit for the pets. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, exactly. Brandon <laughs> probably remembers Counselor Mark having all those um, pets. His pets were um, uh, they were ticks. Counselor Mark oh, was raising man. ticks. That that really one. I, well, there was the tick story where I I picked some up in Kentucky. Yeah, and uh, which of course Kentucky is just a, a bastion of evil bugs. <laughs> and it's, it's, oh yeah, it's, not it's a, the middle south. It's, it's, while I offend people here, let me let me get one thing straight though. Every mosquito in in America lives in Mississippi and yes. commutes. <laughs> the, honest to God, they all live in Mississippi and commute. Because I was in Southern Mississippi on a day. It was sunset and it must have been at least ninety seven degrees and it was a hundred and fifteen percent humidity. Uh, I mean, it was it it was wetter than wet. And these mosquitoes, I got out of the car and you think that I had been shellacked with, you know, barbecue sauce. Cause <laughs> oh my god, they went to town. I, the people were running into the gas station to pay and then running out putting the pump in their car, getting in their car, running the AC as hard as they can, putting the pump back, getting back in their car, and then, of course, realizing driving to southern Mississippi is one of the worst mistakes you can make and heading for Alabama. And that's just as bad almost, but not quite. So. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> now, hey, back to something important. Let's talk <laughs> about cast off radio. Cast, cast them, off them off radio. Brandon, cast them off. what's that? That sounds Russian. Brandon, what the hell are you doing cast over there? Cast them off. What's what's going Brandon, on? Cast them off. What's this all about? <laughs> <laughs> it's like you ought to be on the bridge of the Enterprise. I, I don't know. It's another vessel. It's just another vessel. Another vessel. Like, the rains have passed them off. You know that somebody's about to get killed. Okay. You know? <laughs> exactly. He's wearing a red shirt. I think Bra I think Brandon would like to cast us off about now. Yeah. Sorry, why, dude. Why you got to go I, through. I, you want to be part of the club. You got to go through the pain. That's it, man. <laughs> you got to tie your shirts in a knot. You better be wearing high heels when you do it. <laughs> That's right. That's right. You better smile, or we're gonna think you have a bad attitude. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah. Oh, sure. oh, How yeah. could I possibly have a bad attitude with this? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> so, Where's Brandon, book, it's man? been nice. It it's been nice talking to you. What's the name of your book? <laughs> Before you go, no. 
What are you hocking? <laughs> 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 Whatever oh, you're man, hocking, I gotta, just I gotta tell you guys. Way up front. <laughs> Uh, I, I do have to throw in real quick here. I actually got to meet Dr. Michael Heiser. Uh, oh, in, in person. In person. He was here for the uh, Society of Biblical Literacy uh, uh, thing, convention here in Atlanta. I but was going to ask you. I, I, which I'm not a member yet because I hadn't had the money to join in years. Did he like but you? He, he, uh, apparently. he. Rem- I reminded. I went up to him and was like, hey, Gandalf, I'm Aragorn. <laughs> Ah, like, yes, the Middle Earth. You're on the Iron Show. I'm like, yes, yes, I was. <laughs> I'm so sorry we accidentally trapped you into an interview that you had no idea you were going to be doing. <laughs> it's, 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 I actually had time to do it, so it worked out well. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. We... He was very cool about it. I enjoyed his presentation. Um, but it, it's always fun to get to meet your heroes and find out, hey, they're actually nice in person because, you know, that's not always a given. <laughs> Yes, because yeah, I'm horrible. I mean, if anybody <laughs> likes me and they met me, they'd be put out. Oh so, no, that's are you not serious. True. That's first not of true. all, I can't get around the table because you're sitting there. And <laughs> second of all, you, you just you keep saying these things. So no, <laughs> he keeps I, saying. Do you know how long things. it's been since I've been on the Iron Show? I'm gonna uh, Bogart this whole show. Really, not just that long, long really, Bogart, man. It's been yeah. like. Eight months, man. I, I've had my wow. bogarting for the moment. I'm gonna, I'm gonna try to back off. <laughs> yes, I changed his. Nah, dude, you step up proud, man. I changed his name some time ago from Rabbi Mike to Grab My Mic. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah! I actually, oh my gosh, that is I, awesome. I said that into my that phone. Is- Oh, I that said that into brilliant. my. I said it into my phone and Grab it translated me into text. Grab my mic. I'm like, that's <laughs> it. <laughs> oh yeah. Oh. Well, there's a reason I haven't been on this show for about a year and a half. It's because we've been in the Book of Judges, and um. Oh my God. Matthew Miller could not make it tonight. He had to work late. So I thought, hey, yeah, we got Brandon. Thank right. God for small miracles. Right? <laughs> <laughs> well, we I, we got Brandon coming on, and and I thought, you know, Brandon has talked to me. You know, he's like this. Uh, he's like, um, he worships the ground that uh, Mark Couts and Mark Breton walks I, I on. Can't so. Believe that. That and so I thought I'd <laughs> surprise him. He gets, I can't believe that. He gets to all. talk to his I'm hero. Gonna fart. I'm gonna fart really loud now to just totally break the. <laughs> Break the illusion. Brandon, burn some incense and tell Rabbi Mike how much you love him. No, that didn't really happen. (laughs) (laughs) It's just, you know, it's cool because this community exists and there's so many people that are a part of it. And it's, it's like, I'm fringe part of it. It's like, I'm, I'm there and I hear and I, and I hang out and, and I come around and, and I'm, you know, I'm, I'm kind of like a dog that sort of just sniffs around and sort of pokes around a little bit and everything. And then I hear something and I run away. <laughs> That's not. <laughs> so it's like, you know, if somebody doesn't just beg me to do something, I'm just like, you know, throw me a bone. Dad. I did. I actually, Council Mark's throwing me a bone tonight. I had to talk him into it. Going, well, I, don't I get real pumped because I was preaching at the Nash, Nash I'm going to brag on myself. Preaching at the Nashville Rescue Mission tonight because I do that every other month on the first week of the month on Thursday. And because they got so many preachers that come through this place and they got these guys, they call them crying preachers, where they get up there and they start crying and they're like, oh, God loves you. And you got to you got to repent. You, oh, you know, and, and, and I just get up there and talk about the Bible and. Everybody's sort of like, man, oh god, thank goodness you're here. With that's like the fifth altar call this week, and and <laughs> I, I love, I love no teaching more. up there. It's 400 homeless guys in this really nice chapel, and it's great because it's totally humbling. Like because there's got to be at least 10 of them in there that are asleep and they're snoring. <laughs> and so you're up there and you're really, you know, you're preaching up a storm, right? You know, and you're like, and God came down the mountain with, you know, na 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 and Moses with these fifteen, no, ten, ten commandments. <laughs> and, and and everybody's, you know, some guys are like, Amen, brother, and whatever, and then you hear <laughs> and, 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 and you just kind of get that moment and you're like, you know, Lord. Thank you for the Holy Spirit that works among us. <laughs> well, you know, it's subliminable. It's subliminable preaching. Subliminable that. preaching. Yeah, that's right. It's like sleep. I, I do it when you're asleep. It's like Evelyn Wood slept red. You will not be an abolitionist. You will not be, a, you know, you will not be an annihilationist. 
<laughs> I say it the Lord. It's not working. It's not working. <laughs> um, thank good. I like that one because you don't have to argue about it because none of us have come back to tell us. I've heard of people going to heaven and coming back. I haven't really heard anything about people going to hell and coming back and saying, I have. Yeah, wiping people out left and right. I didn't say there's no. I didn't like say that, there's. Man, like I that. didn't say there's no hell. You're making a lot of assumptions. I'm not assuming anything. I know exactly what annihilationists believe. What do they believe? Well, there's the judgment seat, sitting sheep and the goats, and if you're a goat, you go in the can, and it's hot and horrible, gnashing of teeth, and then poof, you're gone. When hell is thrown into the lake of fire. When hell is thrown into the lake of fire. Right. So destroyed. hell is the storage bin for all you, you know, not you. Right. I mean, for those people who are not saved. They go into hell, Gahana. And then hell is destroyed. And then hell is destroyed. And when hell is thrown into the lake of fire. Poof, and then, lights and out. And then it's then it's done. Yeah. Look, and the only uh, people I'm, that. I, I'm sorry, Johnny. I have to tell you something. What's that? I have been to Gehenna. Okay. I've been to Gehenna. It's actually a very nice neighborhood now. <laughs> I live in Gehenna. What are you talking about? The Valley of Hinnom is actually a very nice neighborhood in Jerusalem now. Is it really? I came back, I came back from visiting about, oh man, it must have been uh, like eight years ago and uh, told all my uh, uh, you know, non-believing friends, like, well guys, the bad news is I've been to Gehenna. I've seen it. The good news is it's a nice neighborhood. You'll be very comfortable there. Yeah, there's like there condos goes. and swimming except pools. For, and... Except, except for the worms, it's great. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's like Oregon. They just legalized green bud, and <laughs> yeah, Oregon. Unfortunately, you're all going to die of dysentery before you get to Oregon. But that's a whole different story. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh yeah, because yeah, you're on the trail. Yeah, <laughs> I'm Good. sorry, your aunt Susan just ran trying to catch a bass. Kids are just like what? <laughs> Like, oh man, you make me feel old. <laughs> hey, people still play Oregon Trail because it's inconquerable. <laughs> yeah, I'm serious, man. What? The so only way that game could turn out right is if you get like to Missouri and you just cross the river, and then there's a jet. <laughs> like, all right, everybody, just ditch the wagon. Feed the horse, cut him loose. We're all flying to Oregon. Oh, the Oregon Trail. You're talking yeah. about the Oregon Trail. You might get airsick on the flight, but at least all of you don't just die. No, 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 no. That game, you, you would die of the air sickness. Okay, that that's, a, just, that's how horrible that game was. Is that a game, the Oregon now, Trail? You have now puked out yeah, your intestines, it, it was and fun. people are using them for a jump back, rope. The, was, the whole party is dead. It back in the schools in the like 80s and 90s that they had on the Macs that you know were being donated to the schools left and right at the time, and you would play it because, well, it was there, and it was better than doing anything involved with classwork. But you would it, the whole idea is you're trying to manage your resources as you try to get to Oregon, and inevitably you die i mean it's not a question of if you die it's how you die and does it make a good story to tell your buddies later oh <laughs> uh, well i never yeah. even heard of that oh it's an it's actually a really fun game for all that we're joking about it um it, there's a reason we have fond memories of it killing us so often it's kind of like net hack that way for those who have played uh, net hack uh, oh, the Oregon Trail. <laughs> Did you know I could take you and show you places where there's still wagon ruts because it's in the high desert and they don't. It doesn't rain there. It's pretty trippy. Where? It's like people ate each other like 150, 60 years ago, right there. <laughs> wow! <laughs> they ran out of food and they ate each other. Real common <laughs> on the Oregon Trail. <laughs> That's some back bacon. <laughs> <laughs> hey, if you get a chance, go on YouTube and look up the real life Oregon Trail players. There's a bunch of people that dressed up like that era, and they went around trying to trade people raw bacon for like eggs or anything, and just out on the street. And they're like, got hands full of raw bacon. <laughs> Salt and they're pork. like, I need some oats, you know. <laughs> <laughs> what did they, did they do and did they get any? People were freaking out, man. Well, you shove raw bacon in someone's face and I'd say a good nine out of ten of them are probably going to react kind of wrong about it. Man, you shove raw bacon in my face. I'll like go trade anything I got on oh, hand. Yeah, because <laughs> yeah, you'll just get really mad and fry it on your head. Rabbi Mike wouldn't even be bothered because he'd just want to smell it while you're cooking it. He couldn't eat yeah, any Yeah, but... no, I actually... Recently, at synagogue, someone was like, man, this person knows how to make turkey bacon until it tastes like a real thing. I'm like, 
Yeah, <laughs> Does he also turn water into wine? Because there's just no way. <laughs> there is no way. Oh man, it is not going to happen. Yeah, I Rabbi Mike told that me you that have to have turkey bacon should be like the big indicator that we're, we're the loopholes have now <laughs> grown in the law so big that we can drive trucks through them. So because you got to have bacon and you got to have turkey and you well, got to do that. It, it's oh, like it used to be. Here we go. Thank you, you not be a Mark. rabbi unless you could prove that bacon was kosher. And, you know, it's like, you know, <laughs> the idea being that you had to be that good of an arguer that you could make, you could convince people that bacon was kosher despite the, you know, the despite the scripture. I'm like, that's funny. I'm really tempted to try to make that work. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. I had this guy, he was uh, a, an observant Jew. I was friends with, he was a programmer and, uh, well, he was mostly observant anyways. Uh, but he <laughs> told me that he told me that <laughs> they ate, they ate pork but they only they just went ahead and just called it white meat <laughs> so so they didn't have bacon so they missed out on the best part but but uh they would eat you know like pork chops or whatever and they just called it white meat that's all they called it and there you go there was their pass their pass on 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 the pork was that <laughs> Me yeah, personally, I, I, I think trichinosis is great. Nanny. So pork's on the menu. The, the, if, have you ever seen the show The Nanny with Fran Drescher? Yeah, 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 yeah. If, if you're Jewish, hey simultaneously the funniest thing you've ever seen and the most offensive thing you've ever seen. <laughs> um, and it's, <laughs> but there's this one part where um, uh, they're like, you know, eating out, and you know, she orders like the mushu pork, and the kid's like, Fran, it's pork, and she's like, Oh, honey, it doesn't count if it's Chinese. <laughs> Oh, jeez. <laughs> I remember that. There you Dude, go. It, it, look, one of the things about being Jewish, you realize just how few Jews take it that seriously because you'll sit there and, and if you go to a Chinese restaurant, like, you know, after, right after sundown on Saturday, you'll find all the people wearing the yarmulkes are the ones that are fighting each other over, over the shrimp and pork. And it's just like, guys, take the yarmulkes off first at least, please. Yeah. <laughs> Be good Baptists. <laughs> Don't act like you know each other. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. What did you say? Hey, Brandon, what how you doing? I'm doing great. <laughs> Just hanging on, hanging on for dear life. Out, You're probably man. like that Don't poor little kid up. with water wings who's got stuck in the deep end of the pool. Be over and here. He's kicking and he's kicking, <laughs> but nobody cares. Oh yeah, oh yeah, oh yeah. Brandon hits his little water. How's it feel down there, Brandon? Dark. Is it scary? <laughs> Can you hear a voice? Is a voice telling, telling you to get, get a pop tart? tart? <laughs> is it out of me? Cookies, cookies and cream. I like cookies and cream pop tart. While you're down in a black hole, true for your life. life. Wondering, Wondering what in the world could possibly happen. Yeah, give me a give pop tart. tart. <laughs> 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 That reminds me, you know, speaking of Brandon's ministry to addiction, um, I'm recovering addicts. Uh, Counselor Mark once told me that he thought he was, uh, like, addicted to food. He thought, he goes, dude, I think I'm a user. So I wrote him a song. I wrote a song, and I ran it past my wife. I, wrote, <laughs> I, wrote, <laughs> I remember this. I wrote Counselor. I wish I had my guitar. I could play. Oh, wrote, man. My wife came to visit. I go, hey, Counselor Mark, I wrote a song about him, and uh, what do you think? I, she goes, yeah, run it by me. I was like, you're a loser and abuser. Strung out on Pop-Tarts. You're a loser. <laughs> yeah. That's it, man. I did a lot for my self-esteem. Twinkies <laughs> down your sotho guts. More fruit pies than any ten of us. Oh, no, slave. I had a theory that, you know, it, food was just an addiction. The problem was nobody had ever survived withdrawal. Yes, <laughs> no. <laughs> yes, I was telling oh, Brandon. Man, believe I was... it or not, guys, thanks to DMS-5, uh, <laughs> uh, so much federal I actually, I actually have an official diagnosis, and we figured it out that I had this problem all the way back to when I was about 14. And it's actually a for real diagnosis. Now, do I use it as an excuse? No. But it is binge eating disorder. And, oh, B and, and people -E -D. who have binge Bed. eating disorder, Bed. B -E -D, uh, Bed. When, they, when they get food in front of them, they panic and they feel like they got to eat it all and they eat really fast. 
And if there's food in the kitchen and they've got some on their plate and there's some in the kitchen, all they can think about is what the what's going to happen to the food in the kitchen. That and so like, since I've been in basic training, have you ever? <laughs> <laughs> Man, he's good. you go out because you don't. I, well, uh, yeah, exactly. I I have. Uh, all brothers disorder, which is say that I grew up with, and there were all boys, no girls. Uh-huh. And so constantly to this day, my wife is like, honey, will you please chew your food? You're inhaling it. I'm like, I, I'm sorry. It's just the way I eat. Come on. Yeah. Just, just enjoy the food. I'm enjoying it. You ate it in 4.5 seconds, and that was three courses. Yeah, well, I had three brothers, honey. If it was here, it was the quick and the hungry. Kill or be <laughs> killed. Kill or be killed. Hey. See, what I need is one of those stupid little fake Zen garden rakes. <laughs> <laughs> I take a bite. I put my fork down. Yeah, with the little I sandbox. Bite, I, I rake that sand, and I just keep raking that sand. This is going in my stand-up routine, by the way. And I, and I just rake that sand, and I'm like, mm, one, mm, two. <laughs> Three. Oh yeah, I'm all kinds of zen about food now. <laughs> my mother in law, yeah. or my grandmother in law, Sarah's grandmother, um, she would sit there and tell Sarah over and over again, "You have to have ch- twenty chews, honey, twenty chews." Right. And yeah. she joked. One day, she's over the, back before Sarah and I were married. She's over at my place, and I'm talking to her, and she she's a little hungry. It's like, well, you know, you want some cereal or something? That's about all I have. And she's like, "Yeah, sure." And no joke. She sat there, and every bite of the cereal, she took at least 20 chews on. Wow. Now, we're talking cereal. It, by the time she gets to about four bites of doing 20 chews each, it's a soggy mess. And she is still chewing on this soggy mess that she could just drink down. <laughs> of Man. Did you see that new movie with Jack Black where he becomes a slave to that old rich old lady and and then he ends up killing her because she drives him insane? It's a true story, but Jack Black plays the guy and they're in the Mexican restaurant and uh, she, and he, she, he's going, I don't think 20 chews applies to refried beans. <laughs> you know, that's oh, that's like my discussions with my, gra- with my mother and grandmother-in-law, seriously. It's... <laughs> <laughs> I, I love my, my grandmother and I it got along great because it's like I not I was raised in the church. I've told people this before, uh, not in the synagogue, and therefore I'm utterly immune to Jewish guilt. <laughs> and so, uh, um, so my grandmother would sit there and try to pull the Jewish guilt thing on me, and I was just like, meh. <laughs> and she finally stopped. And the thing is, we got along great because she knew that if I came out to visit her. That is because I really wanted to, not because she guilted me into it. So she loved me. <laughs> That's funny. So it worked out really, really well that way. Oh, man. We actually have uh, uh, Matthew Miller and uh, and uh, our dear friend Brian Ingram wants to join us. So we're going to here add him in oh, here. Wow. Since I'm we're going nowhere, since we're <laughs> since we're going nowhere, let's go nowhere with Matthew Miller. <laughs> <laughs> Once in a while, we have to have a session that has absolutely nothing to do with anything. We're just having fun, you know, folks? <laughs> that seems to be the direction we're heading on this one. I still feel bad for Brandon, though. Brandon, you got to say something. He you have to use your dude. You, you won't let to use your elbows. And, and like, this is like roller der- verbal roller derby. And you got to, you just got to, you know, you got to. You know, throw some elbows. Those. You got to get, get, get out, out of that, that really dark hole, man. You got to throw some elbows. <laughs> <laughs> it just hurt us. Hurt He's, us back. He told me, uh, he goes, I'm scared to hang out with these big brains. I go, well, don't be scared of Rabbi Mike, but you should yeah, be scared of Matthew Miller. A genius here tonight, I'm telling you. <laughs> What's hey, up, man? Even Einstein made funny faces. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Matthew. <laughs> Are you there? What? <laughs> I broke a <laughs> card- <laughs> oh, I broke a cardinal rule of the Iron Show by saying, "Are you there?" Oh my gosh! So, M- Counselor Mark's here. Yeah, we oh, got yeah. Counselor Mark. We got Brandon of Castenoff Ministries. Cast M off Ministries, like E M, like them without the T H. Oh my goodness! Cast and he's been off. a part of all this. He hasn't. Yes. He can't say he one word while watching us go on. The poor guy. <laughs> oh my goodness! Well, well, just, it's like I a horror. 
<laughs> it's like a horrible Christmas parade in some town with 1,200 people, and the Shriners are wearing their fezes, and they're all doing donuts in their go-karts, and poor Brandon is just sitting there watching this go down. Ah! No, it's more like a, it's more like a train wreck. In slow motion, the the music's playing dramatically. The slow motion is hit. The trains are flipping. Children are flying out, and he's just sitting there going, "Wow, I should be feel horrified by this," and yet, I'm so drawn to it. <laughs> so drawn to Man, it. Man, we got so many people coming on this show now. It might as well be the Jerry Lewis telethon. I don't believe that we have we had five people here tonight. I'm oh, probably going to lose. The band's I'm glad I got the new... <laughs> I'm glad I got the new broadband connection. Brian Ingram, are you there? I'm hoping so. <laughs> oh, yeah! I heard, I heard oh. somebody. I th- yep, we're, we're doing the telethon now. Folks, Wow! look at this poor boy. Johnny and- is all alone on Christmas. Well, almost to Christmas. There we go. Here we go. In his trailer. Please uh-huh. open up your hearts enough to buy Johnny a turkey. Oh, yeah! Oh, yeah! I will eat it. I will be like Rabbi Mike and eat it. It's Thanksgiving. My brain hasn't recovered from the blood draining to my stomach yet. <laughs> I will be like Rabbi Mike and Matthew Miller. I will eat it in one bite, and then I will raid the rest of the kitchen. <laughs> It'll be just like that scene out of Christmas Story where the dogs jump in. You know, I have never watched that show. What? Dude, what there's something a lot of people don't know about it is that when they filmed it, they actually used cuss words. They oh. actually used cuss words and it was so bad that they had to go in and dub all of the Rick Frickin Frag Frickin Frag I'm like Fred Fl- Flintstone likes to say. <laughs> So I'm actually no, that was, writing this down. We've got Brandon. That was we lit- got Rabbi Mike. We got Matthew Miller. We got Johnny. I'm gonna put my name down too because I'm easily confused. Uh, well, we uh, yeah. And then uh, anybody else here? Anybody Brian else? Brian Ingram. Brian Ingram. Okay, well you need to put that on your name tag. No, we don't. <laughs> I'm just going with Brian because. The bride, man. Unless, unless the you're bride. Re- unless you're really tore up about the Ingram part, I'm just oh, kidding. Who am I? I? Like I I'm like, like some guest go. on his show, and I'm I'm telling everybody what names they got to go by. <laughs> here we go. Well, I, I, have I, you guys? I, uh, let me jump in here. Uh, you, you that really wanted a Bible stage tonight? Sorry. <laughs> We're going to well, get have there. You guys, have you guys let Brandon actually talk yet? No, they won't let him talk. Brandon, what's up? How's it going? <laughs> <laughs> Just like, you know, man. <laughs> what was you wanting to talk about tonight? We can talk about anything, man. We we got the whole spill here. I'm just here to hang out. I'm good with whatever. We're all just sitting around the Cracker Barrel going on about how Johnny's a heretic. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, Yeah, because they're going to throw hell into the lake of fire, and and then it'll be gone. (laughs) Yeah, Counselor Mark doesn't like my annihilationist perspective. You know, I don't care. (laughs) I think that's a better way to put it. I just, I don't care. People who don't believe what I believe, I just forget about it. I don't care. <laughs> I, I, I'm not, I'm not burning time on this one. It's like, yeah. It's Cause like, you just want to bait. This is, a, this is a bait and switch. This is a bait and switch. He's going to try to sucker us in there to start talking about this. No, I don't then do that. He's no, going to no, start no. spouting some kind of weird Mormon crap. I know it. Don't do that. Right, Matthew? No, no don't do it, man. I don't do. No, I don't do don't that. Don't do it. I'm here now. Uh uh-uh. uh I know Matthew Miller. Uh uh-uh. uh Yeah, Mark. Y'all don't, y'all don't want to hear the whip crack. Yes. Yeah, Counselor Mark will dismiss me out of hand. Matthew Miller will kick my ass. Yeah. On the other this hand, this is true. <laughs> so, so Matthew Miller, go back to interviewing Brandon. All right. Um, here, to salvage this like, ask him what he's about. Look. We're going to drag you into the minds of the Bry and Matthew, Brandon. Um, I am sitting here looking at the iconography uh, that is displayed on Hezekiah's seal. This is uh, live and late breaking. They just uh, discovered this seal December 2nd, right? Uh, Today or yesterday, something like that. That Um, can't be right. There's no evidence for the kingdom of Judah. 
Well, <laughs> Brandon, Sorry. in your opinion, uh, Brandon, in 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 your opinion, why is the symbol for Asher on this seal, the God Asher? It's a wing disc right in the middle. You can look right at it. I can answer that. Go ahead, Brandon. You're just gonna throw me to the wolves, aren't you? Yes. Yep. <laughs> That's what, what we do on the earth. <laughs> we throw you to Matthew Miller and see if you survive. <laughs> Johnny does. Why don't you tell us, Matthew? Why the why this... Brandon? I got a song for you. It's Apathy. This well, has been such a good friend to me. <laughs> I just ignore the people, and they ain't be. So I believe in apathy. <laughs> Oh my! <laughs> Just be Come lucky. On, lucky if Matthew Miller's not asking you the question, Counselor Mark. Oh, I wouldn't answer it. <laughs> yes. <Yeah. No. laughs> you know so the but. seals on what? <laughs> it's the seal, the Hezekiah seal, and it's got the picture, a picture symbol of the god Ashur. Maybe he took Asher down somehow in the kingdom, and now he's known as an Asher killer. That's actually pretty close, actually, right, Matthew? It's not yeah, that see, bad. I ain't as dumb as you think. <laughs> well, uh, Brian, the first thing he said was, uh, I got a feeling that Hezekiah's ten steps are encoded on this seal, and I'm sitting here looking at it. Now, they they have uh, what they call an Anka uh, symbol there, which looks like a cross with a loop on the top of it. Yeah, an Ankh. So if you count the lines, okay, there's six lines below, six lines above, and it's drawn to your attention because Asher's wings are pointed down. And with the two and car symbol with the circles on top, that's ten lines. There's two lines in each cross, three above, three below. That's ten axes there associated with uh, a sphere. So, oh, you have to have a sphere has to have ten axes. No, it, he's telling you that Hezekiah has ten steps. Oh, okay, I thought you were saying On that. On a sphere, wait. And surely look. they thought the world was flat. Yeah, it was a dome. Oh, that's Come right. On. On a turtle's yeah. back. It's on a turtle's back. Everybody knows that. Still yeah. is. Yeah, let's not go tur- there. No, no, it's on four elephants. The elephants are riding the turtle. <laughs> Yeah, but the elephants are from India. <laughs> and then all of a sudden it starts looking like that scene out of Aladdin where the genie has all those animals balancing on top of each other. Yeah. You oh. ain't never had a fun like me. <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, Stan, Stan Deo actually pointed out that the earth does rest on four pillars. They're called cratons and they're columns of um, rock that go way, way down into the mantle. And wow. they're geologically stable. And if if the if it wasn't for those four cratons, those four pillars, the Earth would really be earthquaking all the time. Oh, I right. looked that up. I hadn't read that one. It's, it seems odd in a, in, a, in a. I'm sorry, I cut you off, dude. It seems odd in a round planet, the sphere, the sphere, that you would only have four of them. It seems like you'd have to have, you know, one, two, three, four, five, six. Seems well, like you'd have to have six of them. No, because they spin around an axis. So to create, oh, okay, well, that's different. Then. If they're moving, then that's different. Right. You, I saw you the core. Just... Hey, I saw the core. Oh, you did. I know what's going on on the inside <laughs> of this planet. <laughs> really? I saw that movie, and I know that documentary. <laughs> oh, you do. It's okay. true. I know. I'm that. glad you have all that down pat. <laughs> <laughs> Don't call me back. If we can't trust Hollywood to give us real science, dude, who can we trust? Oh, oh no. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. This I don't is- know. I've got, I've been listening to, and I'm going to, we're going to jump the tracks for a sec, and we can all get right back to Asher uh, because it's thrilling. Um, But I'm sorry, guys. I'm in a mood. Uh, <laughs> You're making oh, fun of us. You're but, making uh, fun of us, prophecy it's, nerds. It's, it's, it's kind of like it, it, it's like after it's at like what's happened in San Bernardino. Kick his ass, and Matthew. Then watching CNN, it's like you you got to wonder if there's like a parallel Earth that is intersecting with ours, and somehow these people who cannot possibly have more than a brainstem 
describe what happened in San Bernardino and come to the conclusions that they do. It's like, what? <laughs> and I, so, I've been you know, kind of busy today, so I have not had a chance to like see the news interviews or anything. Like, oh what? my gosh! I'm sure Brian Ingram has something to say about San Bernardino. He's usually really up on these things. All right, Brian. Uh, no, not this week. <laughs> okay, I haven't had time. I tried. <laughs> hey, step into the box, man. Take a swing. Oh, I'm watching the, immediately, immediately. I know what comes to my mind. <laughs> immediately, the commentator, who's supposed to be an expert on this stuff, says, well, I think it's a right-wing militia because they were organized and they were body armor and they didn't kill themselves. And he's like, well, what information are you basing this on? And he's like, <laughs> none. We really don't have any. <laughs> he really said that. Oh, geez. Well, we well, yeah, they would. But... What do you think, Matthew? Oh, let Bri talk. Just one sec. I'm trying to. Why well, starting? All right. Can you guys still hear me? <laughs> yep. Yeah. I got you. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Okay. Well, I mean, we've uh, brought this to light a little bit in the past. Um, you know, it's kind of uh, very obvious that uh, Homeland Security and you know every very branch has pretty much had their eyes on homegrown terror. Um, as its top priority for quite some time. So was it a, I hate to say it, but was it a crusader militia? Possible. But at the same time, I think people are neglecting to remember the fact that the attacks in France were orchestrated. Yes, they were members of ISIS, but they were also native French. Yeah, so were I've Frenchmen, been yeah. a little bit curious if somehow that's connected, but problem is, is if ISIS did do it, they have a track record for saying, we did this. And if they yeah. didn't, they'll keep their mouth shut. So probably we could be looking at a homegrown militia. I looked at the whole story for about 15 seconds last night. I've been working on getting a video rig going first to stream live YouTube, and it's consumed my time for almost a week. Wow. Well, I, the first thing that comes to my mind is uh, Republican, for one. Uh and I'm not saying that flippantly, uh, but yep. Republican is first thing. I mean, because that's what you know the the argument always is. But more importantly, when you look at this on the surface, why would anybody attack disabled people? Nobody's going to claim that. Uh, no, right. not even a terrorist. An no, party. didn't actually attack the disabled people. There was an office party running out a facility there that was attacked. But still, it's a place where disabled people are attended to. But it seemed like they. They aimed for that particular room for some reason, you know. I, I I heard the commentators talking about how they were trying to put it off. As soon as they finally did figure out that it wasn't white people, but rather, and I'm talking about this extremely objectively. Okay, I'm not throwing, I'm I'm not I'm not a racist like somebody said on on a thread recently because I said something about their grammar. Um, <laughs> yes, I'm Conan the grammarian. Um, <laughs> Oh, <laughs> I did. I no, got on there, and I honestly, I asked the guy. I felt horrible. My wife was like, "What's wrong with you, man? You, you're acting weird." I said, "Well, hon, I was on this thread, and it was discussed, and it had to do with something." And I asked the guy because I talked to people from other countries, and I asked the guy if he was from another country because he was absolutely killing the English language. And I guess you know that snide remark. You know, he just wrote back, "You're a racist." And I thought to myself, really? Well, that's, that's that's the answer to everything nowadays, though. Oh, you know, I know. Exactly. But but looking at it objectively as much as I can from what, I, what I've seen, they got to the house where this couple, married couple, lived. They had 13 more pipe bombs built with a bunch of gear to make more. And they had a remote detonated, you know, they didn't set it off, thank goodness, um, at the party. It was a Christmas party at a place where the guy worked. And it was like, I thought to myself, okay, this might be a radicalized cell. Because he had six guys helping, according to the neighbor, who wouldn't say anything because she didn't want to seem like a racist. So now we're so PC that we can't even talk about it. And and uh, so she was worried about it. And all of a sudden, this guy and his wife took delivery of a bunch of stuff that other uh, uh, Middle Eastern looking guys dropped off. And... And then it was them, and one person's in the wind. I can't wait till they find that guy. 
And uh, so, you know, these guys had just come, gone to Saudi Arabia. They had proof they'd been uh, up into, uh, oh, man, I can't remember the country. It's not Syria, but it, it's around there. It's another area where you run into problems. And And I looked at it, and I was listening to the jumping off points of the news commentators that are just like, the, it doesn't fit. As soon as I heard it and then somebody on the radio was like, and we're getting reports it was three white people. I looked at my son. We were out working in my driveway on something. And I said, if that's three white people, this is a false flag. And, right. and so, you know, that's, you know, me believing in all the stuff. That oh, I yeah, do. me but too. I'm with you. I was just like, that's a false flag then. And, th- and, then, uh, and then as it unfolded and people quit immediately trying to pin it on some right wing, you know, disabled vet whatever you know which you know i fit that category i'm surprised they're not knocking my studio door down right now but uh give them a couple more minutes they're a little bit yeah i go through all the bureaucracy (laughs) they're listening didn't you hear the click on the line that'll beat the red tape and then uh uh, and and so i started hearing it and i thought well you know i think that there's people all over the world for some very good reasons and also some very bad reasons that just hate. They just hate, and they hate us. Yep. And by us, I just mean, I don't know, people in the country that aren't like them. Westerners. And that's been the way it's been since, you know, the first person landed on the shores. Yeah, immediately, it was just like, oh, you're less than human. I've seen Pocahontas. I know how it played out. <laughs> Okay. And so, you know, <laughs> yeah, it's movie night at the Breton. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. No, I mean, but I, you yeah, notice that it, every single time this happens, though, the, the news media is immediately like, oh, it's a right wing. They are praying that one of these things oh, is I a know. right wing uh, uh, militia group. I mean, they, they're salivating for it. You know, and well, every it single was, time it's something else, you can just see the disappointment uh, in them and quickly try to deflect. Well, we shouldn't judge all members of the group. What? You're judging all members of a group who hasn't even done anything yet. Come on, yeah, guys. They all, look, they all look so deflated like that group of people did when somebody recognized me on an airplane. They're like, oh, hey, you're Mark Breton. And everybody turned around and looked, and they were like, you know, oh, <laughs> you know, it's hilarious. <laughs> so, <laughs> but, That's a terrible moment. I'm sorry. It's one of the awesomest moments of my life because it's like reality. Just I'm glad I wasn't like, there. Beat me like a rented mule. And, and so, but yeah, I heard that. And I was just like, nah, this, this ain't at all what they're saying. And sure enough, and, and I, I really try to avoid watching the news much. I do try to read as much news as I can. Um, and yeah, it was like when that I, I was praying to dear Lord in heaven. And I'm serious about that. When that guy started shooting up Planned Parenthood, the first thing that popped in my mind was, is they found a crazy and aimed him. Yeah. 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 I, so that's what I, I re- think we're all agreed on that one. Yeah. I mean, the thing is, um, if, you're paying attention to some of the stuff that's out there um and you know that there is such thing as human programming and i do because i've run into it a few times mk ultra you you, yeah um and and again i mean and i don't know what the stats are i've my experiences are pretty narrow so i'm not gonna try to say they speak for everything but um when you look at the fact that it's possible Okay, I'm kind of surprised we don't have more incidents aimed at the right wing. Okay, and well, I that's. Think, I think you're going to see it more and more. You know, I think this is just the beginning. I agree. I, I, I agree. I'm just kind of surprised that it hasn't happened already. It's like, okay, yeah, what? Right. Oh, what there, there's something that they're there's some key that they're waiting for. They're waiting for the right moment. What have you? Yeah. Um, and it, when it does happen, I mean. Uh, it's what? it's going to be a media field day of oh yes finally we get to attack the people that are wrong and we get to we get to land based them. Never mind the fact that we have deflected all the attention away from all the people that actually commit terrorist acts and all that. Now we yeah. finally get to target ourselves properly. Yeah. And they're like primed and ready to go. And yeah, because I mean, when's the last time you heard on on regular news about Obama's Tuesday hit list? Yeah. What about drone strikes? 
Do we hear about drone strikes no, on constitutional no. hits? No, no, that'll no. be for the next Republican president. Yeah, exactly. And then all of a sudden they'll adopt that like waterboarding and, and, you know, they'll get that. And it was, I remember hearing a prominent liberal and I can't remember his name, but he's very, very intelligent. I don't want to say for a prominent liberal, but, um, <laughs> he, go ahead and say it. but Roll. he really made it very, very clear how, how Bush did a lot of stuff that was extra constitutional right. where Obama has just flat broken it, just flat out broken it. It was as a president ruling by fiat, doing things utterly unconstitutional. Yeah. And, and that big thing for him was the drone strikes that you could have a target list come into your office every week and you just look at it and go, well, that person dies, that person dies and that person dies. Yep. Well, and, and, so and these are, and these are Americans overseas. It's every week. It's a new scandal. It's something new every week. You could go down the list, and there's so much you can't even pick it all out. You know, I mean, the news couldn't even talk about everything he's done that's unconstitutional and unlawful. And they're but not to go going back to because he's their hero, and because well, right. oh, that might be racist. You know, well, it, the, the thing is, they've got he's got the perfect cover in terms of being able to do anything unconstitutional that he wants because nobody's going to call him on it because oh, we don't want to look racist. Well, that's why they got. That's why they got him in the first place. You know, he's yeah. he's. Oh the, yeah, the, that's why he's chosen. He had no background. Yeah, he for was this. picked. He was picked. I'm yeah, just yeah. wondering who's going to be picked next. Honestly, I do. Uh, and and I look at it and I'm like, okay, they're setting us up completely for absolute disaster, destruction, and redefinition of what this land was maybe kind of sort of supposed to be, yeah. at least on one sheet of paper I've read. You know. And, and and everybody blows past that. I swear that as soon as Washington stepped down, the country just went into this free fall. And, and, and it's like I watch it and I, I'm amazed. And I stay out of politics when I'm talking on the radio because it's like, oh, not again, somebody else. <laughs> but, you know, just it's, it's just, you know, I don't ever want to be just some talking head who's got, you know, opinions. But I do believe – in that programming. And if you want to talk to somebody about it or get stats, talk to Tom Bionic um, on MK Ultra. And then I do believe in the Illuminati and all these different things I'm starting to see differently because I've been listening to Christian Fringe Radio and it makes sense. It's like, you know, Planned Parenthood takes it in the shorts big time and you give it just enough time so people stop thinking so much about those videos. And then some guy who looks like a mugshot in every county. I'm surprised his middle name isn't Ray, Wayne, or or, or something else. I mean, because all of them are named Ray or Wayne, right? In their middle name. And 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 I, he's perfect. He's a perfect nut job to go off on a Planned Parenthood play. Billy Ray Wayne. And, <laughs> yeah, it was Billy Ray Wayne. And and uh, Billy Way Wayne Wayne. Billy, Billy, Billy Wayne. Way way. You will always know okay. the middle name of a serial killer or a spree killer for some reason, you know. Yeah, it's important. <laughs> you know, like uh, it could, it's just, for some reason they got to throw that in there. And I think it's because all these dudes are white except for the DC Snipers, which is one of my favorite football teams. Um, but <laughs> <laughs> sorry. And so. <laughs> oh, uh, yeah, <laughs> oh, gosh. Oh, I'm going to have to. If you I'm pray long to, enough for, pe- enough I, for I am so I, I have said some things tonight that are so bad that I'm going to have to go to a Catholic church just to get. <laughs> yes, offended. you need. Yes, you need to sit yeah, in the booth. Flagellation, self-flagellation. Oh, I just thought you were. I, going I to- tell you what, I have been talking and talking. I'm going to shut up now, and you guys say smart stuff. Well, Matthew, I'd like to know what you meant by Republican. Were you going the same way Mark Breton was, or? Well, I mean, I mean, it's generally. Uh, the Republican side that, you know, says go into the poor neighborhoods and machine gun them. Um, they're anti-poor people. Uh, they're anti, you know, um, they're for uh, taking away uh, unemployment and disability and all that stuff. So, I mean, here in this camp, I mean, we have two camps here that's been provided for us, even though that's a complete lie. Uh, I mean, you can just look at the voting records Ladies and gentlemen, there's no such thing as a Republican. There's no such thing as, as a Democrat. Look at their voting records. They're Republicrats. Okay? Yeah. That's uh, all, 
all of the Republicans will vote Democrat. Uh, all the Democrats vote Republican. So this is a farce anyway. But well, in this I, I game mean, look that at they the play, fact that the ones who are principled on both sides have a tendency to drop out. Okay, Zell Miller. I'm from Georgia here. Okay, yep. he dropped out of the Democratic Party because he saw how corrupt it was getting at the national level and how far it departed from what he saw as the core principles back in the '60s. Okay, and then you look on the Republican side, and you look at where you have a principled Republican like, say, Alan Keyes, and what happens? They ignore him to death. Or you take like a Herman Cain, which would have been a great person to play off against Obama, and he, oh, he's too conservative. Oh, the instant there is even a hint of a scandal, let's throw him under the bus. As a matter of fact, I'll, I wouldn't be surprised if they engineered it. Okay, so yes, absolutely. When you're dealing with the, po the party level politics at the national level. Uh, they are both corrupt, and you can tell by the fact that the principled members of both parties have a tendency to leave after a period of time. Sorry, had to throw that in there. You're right. I mean, I'm really surprised Trey Gowdy, who I'm I'm having a blast watching on YouTube, is uh, is not disgusted utterly by his own party. But I mean, they got rid of Boehner, you know. Yeah, because I mean, y you can only buy so much Kleenex on you know credit cards through the Senate or whatever. <laughs> you know, you remember the bank, the bank scandal. You know, I'm gonna have yeah. to take out a loan for for Kleenex. I'm sorry, I'm John Boehner. <laughs> it's so hard yeah. to be the Speaker of the House. Oh, get oh, out! Man. Get hey, out! I I just Matthew, finish your thought though. I'm, I'm sorry. sorry. Well, well uh, it, it's just that in this paradigm, uh, we know that the Democrats are supposed to be uh, pro-poor people and the Republicans are supposed to be anti-pro people. So looking at it, uh, you immediately get the feeling, or at least I do, that this is a crusader group. This is a uh, – your beans, bullets, and bullions boys that uh, run around and, and claim with a loud screaming voice that they're Christians. Uh, they're Christian militia. So right. it, it, it reeks of that, but uh, knowing the truth of the situation, uh, this has just turned into a major distraction, it is what it is. It's the perfect play if you want to get everybody in America fighting. Absolutely. It's, yes. it's, the, it's the absolute perfect play. It's a distraction when everybody forgets that, ladies and gentlemen, as far as I'm concerned, as far as modern presidents, the last one we had – uh, was John F. Kennedy, and yep. he was, uh, as soon as he signed Executive Order 11110, they put his brains all over his wife in broad daylight, Amen. and nobody ever hinted, nobody ever even, it never even occurred to anybody since that time to order uh, the Secretary of the Treasury to start printing American money. And it never will uh, again. Never and will. it never will again. And we have to remember that's exactly uh, what Abraham Lincoln did, too. Amen. Yep. And uh, they, of course, did what? That's right. They was up in the balcony, but you forget, where was his wife? Right next Everybody to forgets that. Oh, yes, his blood splattered all over his wife. You think they do <sighs> that? That That's okay, actually so something they planned I mean, it's a way of terrorizing families because, for uh, the most part, men of principle are not scared of what happens to themselves. What happened to themselves? Right. It's what it's about at their families, uh, and so that kind of thing is a way of <laughs> a tar taking men of principle, men who are nominally very brave, and saying, "Hey, it's not just you that we can go after." Okay. Well, let's let's think about this, boys and girls. Like I said, this is a perfect play. You see, they attack a place. That's full of disabled people. But yet Brandon pointed out the simple fact that no, not really. They really attacked the business owner, so they really attacked the Republicans that was running a Democratic organization. Look at it, ladies and gentlemen. This is the perfect thing to get everybody in America fighting. It's perfect. I could not have planned it better. It's have genius. Them hit. It's genius. Have them hit. It is. It's absolute genius. Have them hit a disabled center, but don't do that. Have them target an office meeting and take out all of the white-collar 
uh, you know, the man. Have them shoot the man instead. Don't touch the disabled people. Target the man wearing the white collar. It's it's perfect. It's 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 ridiculously perfect. And, so, and also, just to cut in in agreement with that is the idea that I think we have to look at everything through the prism of the upcoming election. Because if you listen to what the Democrat side is saying, and I, I'm I just kind of watch Donald Trump for the entertainment value. I mean, the guy's a, <laughs> he's a riot. You know what I mean? And uh, uh, and so, you know, it's really tough to live in a country that you love and love so many things about it and yet just feel like you just never get to have a dog in the fight. Yeah. You yeah, know, it's and it's harder for and, you. And it's like you want, you want somebody to be able to step well, up, but the establishment won't let them. They won't let them be picked because well, I know just like you guys said, these people are picked. And uh, and like you're talking about, and and then I'll shut up. And whoever else is trying to cut in, I'll let you. Um, that building being attacked, those people being attacked, the way that it happened, uh, the, it's like now the Democrat uh, contestants for for Miss America, they can uh, now they can just be like, well, you're just a bunch of racist and profilers. You know, this was just a couple crazies, right? And then your war on women is for real because look at this guy shooting up this place. And, I mean, think about it. The Democrats are losing. They're losing the presidential race. They, they're, they are losing. And so I All just the think the – All the attention is on the Republican side right now. Yes, absolutely. And I think the timing of it is such where you're going to get to have it's, – it's another opportunity for the establishment that is in office to redefine what domestic terrorism is – so that it cannot be an issue in the election. Wow. That's an interesting point. Because mm. it's just some guy who went off. I heard one of the dudes on CNN called it, uh, what did he call it? You know, they call that workplace violence. He called it workplace terrorism. He just basically, it's like Based. when the guy shot them all up at Fort Hood and they were like, oh, this is a workplace incident. You know, don't call the cops, call OSHA. That's where our real problem's at. Yeah, let's not investigate the actual background of the person who did it either. Let's find some, let, let's make sure that it fits our particular cause. And, well, and yeah, because screaming God is great in Arabic, level. you know, that, that, that so, doesn't mean anything. Always oh, yeah. speak, you know, it's like assault rifle. How, how do you call a rifle an assault rifle just because of the way it looks? You know, they're going to, they're going to spin yeah. anything and call anything, anything they want and push the narrative. And yeah. And you make an interesting point. You know what's what's the true agenda behind this? Are they doing this so that they can do something behind our backs, or are they doing this to to manipulate the outcome of the election cycle? I mean, what's what's the real purpose? There's always something behind it. It's always money, money and power. That's the root of sure. all of it. You know. Sure. So that I guess that's what we need to watch. Where's the money trail? Where's that going? Where? Yeah, where? It's it's weird though because in this instance, you've got Hillary who's out front by a mile and you've got someone like Obama who for all intents and purposes hates her. Mm -hmm. And and it's kind of like, who's holding hands at this party? Cause I don't see it. And you see some of the, the mo the normal money, which of course, like you were talking about, Brandon, look at, you know, follow the money. The normal money is not in this race. No. And that's, it's, I think that's where I was going with this. I think what they're, the point you made, is interesting because it has to make you think, are they doing this to start to funnel that Democratic money into the system that they're not getting now? Right. You know, you want to suck right. it from both sides. You know, ultimately, that's sure. the goal, to suck as much money from as many high-profile high donors as they can to both sides because they're both on the same team. I mean, let's not, let's not sure. play games. Sure. Now, Trump, Trump's an interesting guy. You got a lifelong Democrat who's voted Democrat most of his life. All of a sudden now he's a Republican saying all the right things. But here's the thing with Trump is he doesn't need money. He's got every every bit of money he'll ever want. So is he legit or is he just playing the game? You know, that's, I'd like to hear what you guys think about him. I well, like when him. I think about I, I think he's I'm a somebody Trumpster. who looked up and he was like, oh, well, let me wait my turn. Some Johnny, why don't you pick names out of a hat? Matthew, what do you think about the Donald? 
Uh, the Donald is a great distraction, actually. Um, he is the perfect uh, one to lead a crusader campaign. Oh. The, the perfect one, because he he proclaims uh, all of the right mouthy conservative things. Um, even though he himself said that he has never uh, repented of his sins, He's, he said that publicly. So uh, when I look at Trump, uh, he is the perfect distraction in the middle. Uh, as a matter of fact, he's the perfect way uh, to create a third column. And in creating a third column, you're going to accomplish chaos. Uh, now, we kind of had this before with uh, Ross Perot, but he never went anywhere or done anything. However, uh, Trump is getting uh, the ground coverage that he needs to create a true third column, which is going to create chaos. But I'm speaking from a vantage point, which I really have no authority to speak because I've never voted, not ever. Um, my parents made sure uh, that I would investigate everybody, and they made perfectly clear that I was not to cast my lot with the wicked. So it's never taken me more than two weeks to investigate both uh, both parties, either locally or nationally. Uh, you can always get right to the bottom within two weeks, easy. Uh, just uh, just petition, uh, get the voting record, look at how they voted, yeah, uh, how much campaign money did they get. So I've never voted, ladies and gentlemen. I'm not going to lie to you about it. So uh, in lieu of that, I need to, to pass the buck along because um, Trump is by design a third column. You need to look that up in military tactics and figure out what that is because mm -hmm. he's the perfect one this time. Before you and, pass though. I'd like to know, do you think halfway through this race next year, do you think Trump's going to break off and go independent? Having said what you've said, do you think that's somewhere he's going to go? That's exactly where he's going to go. And he, will do, and he will do so right before the threshold of war. And it will be chaos. And it will be chaos. You think he's he going to take the vote? Well, think about what I just said. Brandon asked me a point-blank question. Oh. And I asked him, and I answered him the best way. He will wait until we've crossed right before we cross the threshold to world war. That's what he's going to do. You can literally set back and create a timeline with the uh, news coverage that's the news blurbs that's come out about Trump and see that's where they're going. They're going to wait right before the threshold to war. Then he's going to take the independent ticket. Wait and see. And then what happens? Well, you have a okay. lot of people who won't cross that party line, no matter what. So Unless think, we go to war. Yeah, and then and then who knows? Okay. Teddy Roosevelt Brandon, almost did it. Actually, then, Brand, then, then you can bring in – then you don't even have to have a vote at that point. Is well, that where you're going with this? You're going where you've never been before. That's where you're going because there's going to be a strike on our soil. I think you're right. That is going to happen. Okay. That's when he'll do it. Wait and see. If it's going to be done, that's how they'll do it. That's how a standard military tactician would do it. So, ladies and gentlemen, Brandon's, there's only one thing. You can go talk to any psychologist you want to. They'll tell you the same thing as me. The only thing that will rattle, that will disrupt, that will blur the, par the party lines is one thing. A military strike on U.S. soil. Shock and awe. Yep. Okay, but then yeah, what, what do you see happening then after that is what I'm asking, Matthew. I already said it three times. I know, Chaos. but will, will he take the vote? That's what I'm saying. Will he win? I don't think at that point yeah. it even matters because of it, the it fact. Won't he, it won't matter. I, I, know, think if, I, think I, even, I think if you go to a national state of emergency and there wouldn't even be an election. Exactly, exactamundo. You've said exactly what I was but, not going to yeah. say. See, that's not – histor historically, though, that's not true. I don't think that has to happen because Lincoln was elected in a, an election by the people in the midst of the Civil War. And so I don't think that people are going to stand for that. 
I, I, I just don't think that in this yeah, in the national one. mood, you're going to see that. But what I can see happen is Trump not doing well in the primaries, there being a strike. And right now, I think that the uh, military industrial complex would rather get behind a buffoon like him to make their money than anybody else that's anywhere near this race. Clinton, worthless. All those other people, worthless. But you put Trump in the seat, and then you're going to see people who are going to be able to milk him and his so-called populism uh, to, to, to get it done, to get what they want out of a war. Wow, that's scary. No well, matter what, we know a war is inevitable. It's inevitable. With the financial situation in the entire world, we're going to go to war because that's the only way they're going to try to make money back. Well, you know? with uh, well, with it, Russia you know, striking look, Turkey. The financial situation, yes, we know that wars drive finances and vice versa. Yeah. Okay, but you're also up against a serious world war clash. Now, we have to be careful about oversimplifying to the point where it's like, oh, it's all about money. Okay, yes, insofar as money is a measure of material control, yeah. that is true. Yeah, it's really However, about power. When you're dealing with the whole thing of the New World Order and you're dealing with the Illuminati and so forth, you have to understand that if you focus so much on the Illuminati, where you the reason we focus on them is because the Illuminati is distinctly Western, even if it likes to adopt Eastern occultism, but it's distinctly Western. It's Western European, it's Western American, uh, well, American period slash Western. But it's not the only player vying for dominance, okay? It just happens to be one we're focused on because we're used to being on top. I don't think we're going to be on top indefinitely. Why? I look at the Bible. The Bible talks about you've got the mystery Babylon, Rome, on top of the beast until the beast finally gets around to turning on her. Well, you go and you look at the beast, you start looking at the nations of the beast, they're all centered in the Middle East, okay? You've got three maybe four major players vying for world dominance. Now, all of them hate us. All of them hate the followers of the true God. Okay. But you've got, uh, you know, Western uh, Illuminatism, you, you know, Satanism, Luciferianism, however you want to describe it. You have Islam. You have, uh, you know, Eastern communist slash pagan worship, which is combined in a weird sort of way in China. I don't. I see that as coming into play at the end there, but if you start laying, laying out the nations, okay, you can't dismiss the Middle Eastern portion. You can't dismiss Islam, and well, and what I actually see happening here, they're not actually necessarily on opposite sides per se because they serve the same master, but that doesn't mean there's not jockeying for position in between them, okay doesn't mean that Babylon doesn't fall just because, you know, the Illuminati and the Club of Rome and all these other groups happen to, on an intrinsic, instinctive level, recognize that, uh, you know, the ma Mahdism, the uh, Islamic uh, messianism that looks for the Mahdi is, uh, you know, intrinsically against their interests and all that. Understand, a lot of what we're seeing right now is in many ways just a setup, but it's not going to play out the way we think it is. We're, we have to be careful not to think that just because we've been on top and the West has dominated for the last 400 years, well, really the last 300, that it's always going to be that way. It will not. Okay. And all these bits, players, and so forth... There's not one conspiracy that, you know, everyone moves exactly correct. There are many conspiracies overlapping. All ultimately seek to erode our sovereignty, our faith, and our walk with God. But they're still jockeying for power. The wars are coming about not just because it makes money, although that's a nice fringe benefit for them. There are people fighting for dominance right now. And none of them are on our side. That's the key point we need to take away from that. Well, let me interject here, too, on top of it, now that you went back to that topic. How many people are aware that, especially once this uh, event played out in France, um, that just happened a few weeks ago here with uh, the ISIS uh, terror 
tack. Mm-hmm. If you look backwards on top of it, going into the realm of at least a month, you are going to find out that a multitude of people have come forward, have stated flat out, look, folks, we are in World War III. Now, I'm not going to mention who this is because that will go into a whole other rabbit trail. Um, I will state, first off, the King of Jordan was one of the key players that came ahead and did exactly that thing. Now, this other uh, report that came out where the comment was made that World War III is in effect stated that it was a piecemeal war. You know, of course, the, uh, the news reporters and interviewers and so forth are going, what is a piecemeal? And he goes on to explain that since in this day and age, nobody declares war any longer – <laughs> yeah. We have wars and rumors of wars. Oh, good one. Yes, yeah. exactly. Huh. Exactly. It, it, the thing is, we have to be careful about avoid uh, about thinking in the old paradigms where war is declared. Um, I don't know. Do any of you guys remember the TV series Millennium back in the late nineties? It was created by the same guy who created the X Files. Yeah, there was. It was a great show because it just asked a lot of questions, got you thinking. But there was one episode where uh, one of the characters makes this point. He says, "Everyone thinks that wars happen in the future. No, wars happen in the past. The fighting that you see is just the inevitable consequence of the war that has already started." World War II started a long time before war was declared by Congress. Yep. The Great War. Well, I mean, war. World War II is just World War I. <laughs> part, exactly. Part two. <laughs> yes. Yeah, part D. <laughs> well, really, has the war ever stopped? You yeah. Know, has it ever really stopped? There's always uh, proxy war all the time. Yeah. Know? And, and yeah, let's, take I, this back to, let's take this back to the scripture here. Okay. Human wars are the effect of supernatural beings. Amen, Warrior brother. Chapter 10. Yeah. Daniel chapter 10. If one, if one needs to go check out this chapter if they've never checked it out before, but that's where the, you know Daniel fasts for three weeks. An angel finally shows up, says, Sorry, I would have been here three weeks ago, but the prince of Persia kept me from coming. I'm sorry, he's not talking about Cyrus. I don't think a human being can stop an angel yeah. of God from showing up when he darn well pleases. No. Right. He says, I had to call on Michael, my namesake, your prince, to help me. Help. And when we go, the prince of Greece will come. What happened when the prince of Greece came? Alexander the Great stomped on the Persian Empire. Yep. Okay. That wasn't a purely human action, although, of course, there were human actions involved. There was a supernatural reality behind that. Now, you go to Revelation chapter 12. You have war in heaven. You think that's going to happen without a war on the earth to match it? Amen. Yeah, that's a really good point. Yeah. And I am, and I, I've tacitly put this out there for I'm still not 100% satisfied, but I'm more and more leaning towards the belief that the heavenly war of Revelation 12 happened during World Wars 1 and 2. I'd like to ask Matthew, um, Matthew, is one of those ancient princes over America? And if he is, which one would it be, do you think? Could it be that maybe be. the Prince of Greece? Or? <clears throat> no, I would not say it would be the, uh, the Prince of Greece. Uh, I would not say that. Uh, I would say that the Prince of Greece is, of course, the Prince of Greece. That's, a, that's an area. That's, that's uh -oh. defined by boundaries. So, yes, we certainly have one, but... Uh, I'm not going to speculate on its name. There's really um, no way to tell. Is there a way to there, make speculate though? Is there a way to take guesses? Like maybe the prince of that was over Tarshish, maybe? Or? No, that that prince is still over that geo that geographical area. That they don't move. <laughs> yeah. uh, their boundaries and borders for their uh, authority does not move. Yeah. May maybe Johnny, think of it more as as offices that govern a region as opposed to individual entities. 
Yes. So the Prince of Persia will always be the Prince of Persia because he is right. the Prince of Persia. But I think it would be – I mean, look at the founding of our nation. I mean, before, before you know, the colonization of America took place, the imperialism that was behind that, uh, if you look at it and see how – you know, we had pagan worship, you know, with what few – Native Americans lived here uh, relative to what was to come in, in Europeans. But I, I would say look at all of the different symbolism of what we have uniquely in, uniquely in America and our founding and the design of our buildings and all of those things. And I am by no means an expert on that. But I would think that if you put all that kind of stuff together and looked at who the most likely – most likely kind of person would be or entity would be behind that. What those sim that symbolism means the most to, I think that would be where you might find a real hint in who is the, 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 the Luciferian power over America. Well, it's well, when we're dealing with that, it's easy to look at landscapes and there's, there's certainly some, reason to look at geography okay but i would say you know again when daniel had his vision his vision wasn't of the prince of greece hanging back in greece his vision was of the prince of greece coming these princes these archons these gods if you uh pick up on the you know whole uh, elohim and b'nai elohim thing that of course dr heiser points out um they aren't they're bound by geography but their movements can be detected by politics okay when the prince of greece came against the prince of persia what happened the prince of persia was forced to retreat back into old persia the prince of greece expanded his power over the middle east okay now he's oh, so in america a, a prince could increase their boundaries through spiritual war which is a, reflected in human war Yes. Yeah, if you yeah, if you read those Frank Peretti books. No, I actually like Frank Peretti. I think he's got I, I a better read on spiritual warfare than a lot of people. Uh, I got the first, some the first two books interesting. really, really well. Um, and I understood he was fictionalizing something that we as humans would have an extremely difficult time visualizing. Mm -hmm. But if you look at just that, if you look at the way the hierarchies worked. And the way that some people stomped on others, you get a picture of exactly what uh, the man was talking about there. And that was yeah. uh, that kind of movement. Yes, exactly. Well, so let, now let let's me... look at the heritage of America. It's a mixed heritage. Okay. On the one hand, we're kind of the inheritors of the British Empire, aren't we? Yep. And the British Empire, in turn, is the inheritor of Rome. So there is a link and I don't know if it's the exact same archon, but there's a link that go, that traces from America to Britain back to Rome. And then on to Greece, ultimately. Well, yeah. That's well, why they say... Me, well, what, we might but, be Hellenistic in a lot of our philosophy <laughs> and thinking, but what, I'm say, but what he was saying makes a lot of sense. I mean, all roads lead to Rome as far as America is concerned. Everything well, let about me, our culture is Roman. Yeah. Brian. Okay, jump Bri in. Brian. Let me bring in a little bit of perspective here. And Matthew can attest to this. He has been to my house. As far as America is concerned, we have a few more regional princes than meets the eye. We do not just have one prince that resides over the entire continent nor over the entire nation. You cross the border at one point as you head into the state of Wisconsin and you yeah. can ask anybody this that has been here missionaries from other parts of the world you will come into an area where the darkness here is above and beyond what you will find even in other nations where missionaries have been to that are you know have a very dark prince itself yeah. That makes so a lot I can of attest to the fact that we have a few princes that are at work within this nation. Now we also have to remember, and as it's been brought up again, you're looking at a geographical location. You uh, have it tied into people groups, 
And let's just cut to the chase here. Okay, America, there is a thing called boats. We had ancient sea travelers coming here since time immemorial. Right. And this can be documented through the roof. So how do we how do we lock this into which people group it's associated with? It's way more complex than we can actually sit back and point a finger at and even get a hint as to who these princes are. It's yep. It's not an easy answer, and I personally am not really going to spend too much time attempting to find out. There's princes well, here. They've been put in place. Go ahead, Matthew. Well, Brian, we, we have to remember that Jeremiah chapter 8 is going to come into effect. Okay, God tells us that uh, this strange event happens whenever they fall. Okay, uh, The peoples in question is going to have to pre present the bones of their ancestors to prove their lineage. Now, when we talk about Michael in the Bible, of course, uh, the Lord our God uh, tells us that he is their prince, the, uh, the people of Israel. So we have to remember that by great extrapolation, the Bible comes out and tells us that uh, there are certain entities that bear over responsibilities to whatever geographical region they went to after the Tower of Babel fell. Okay, so if uh, your yes. lineage uh, is, you know, you've got blonde hair and blue eyes and you're tall. Guess what? You're Scandinavian. Uh, that means that that prince, that power, uh, exercises dominion over you. Now, uh, we have to remember as far uh, uh, as the scene goes, and, and Rabbi Mike mentioned the Illuminati. We can't remember, uh, we can't forget what the Bible tells us. Uh, you know, uh, there in uh, Revelation chapter 17, it says... Uh, that the Illuminati is the one that nukes Babylon, mystery Babylon. It says, uh, verse 16, And the ten horns which you saw, and the beast, these will hate the harlot, and make her desolate and naked, and will eat her flesh, and will burn her, with her, burn her up with fire. For God has put it into their hearts to execute his purpose, by having a common purpose, and by giving their kingdom to the beast, until the words of God will be fulfilled. So we have to remember that by great extrapolation, this is this is explaining to you, well, ladies and gentlemen, America, um, because you've got uh, you've got Scottish people here, you've got uh, you know British people here, you've got Russian people here, and it goes on and on and on. But God has made it perfectly clear in the Bible that. Uh, the breaking up at the Tower of Babel, those people were sent to geographical locations. Those geographical locations, in turn, had administrators. Uh, so this could get very ugly very quickly. And the dark cloud uh, that is somewhere, or for some reason, over uh, where Brian is at, it extenuates. I did not exit that cloud until I got to uh, uh, St. Cloud, Minnesota. That's how far it went. Uh, so, uh, we have areas and regions here obviously in conflict, but we are not called the great melting pot for any flippant reason. That's right. So, you're saying this <laughs> yeah, is setting us up... On that one. Yes, exactly. You're saying this is setting us up for a civil war. Exactamundo. And like I said before, and you know, when I, when. Brandon asked me the question to make sure I made clear to everybody. I didn't say a terrorist attack, ladies and gentlemen. I didn't. I didn't say uh, a 9/11 or a false. No, not a false flag. I said a foreign military strike. You'll know it when you see it. That's really scary. And then yeah. you can take all those political lines you've got and erase them. Wait and see. Yeah. It's us against the aliens. And that, that Independence demonic, Day. That demonic, that darkness, that prince over Wisconsin, that goes all the way down to into Missouri where Scott Air Force Base is. There's a huge uh, – I've, I've been there, and it'll make the hair on the back of your neck stand up. Really? They have, they have a massive satanic uh, cult presence. And right in that area, it's the weirdest thing. You hear stuff in the newspaper all the time about just strange events. And 
it it is it is satanic. I've driven across the country. I've been places. I can tell you when I was somewhere where where the you know the God of Israel, our Father, was worshipped and is worshipped, and I can tell you where he ain't. And and so yeah, there's some. And the thing that is so sad coming back into the world that I deal with as a pastor and a counselor is that it's hate. It's hate and it's bitterness and unforgiveness that creates the power base for these spiritual conflicts to occur. See, it's it's interesting. We talked about how he, uh, the war in heaven will drive the wars on earth, but it's the exact same way going the exact same, you know, the other way. Yeah, I was going to say. The hatred and unforgiveness and rebellion, just like Babylon, or just like Babel. I mean, that rebellion that runs in us so deep that very same thing is the thing that is affecting the powers that rule over those areas whatsoever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven yeah and i remember telling somebody they were talking to me about detroit one time and i looked at it was so weird because it was almost like i wasn't talking oh you should hear matthew and brian sing on detroit it'd scare the hell out of you i i I looked at the person I looked at the person and I said, until Christians are willing to go to Detroit and die for that city, it will never be redeemed. Yeah. And I mean literally die for that city. And and well, so that's that's just where that was at. But what you're talking about with the spiritual powers, I mean, they are definitely ensconced. And I, they're ensconced at the willingness and participation of the people that – are of this earth. Matthew well, and Brian showed me this map of downtown Detroit from the 1800s, and it's built on that. You can even see it now from a sky view. It's a pentagram. Like downtown Detroit extends from a pentagram in the center and moves out. Wow. It's so scary looking. Well, and here's and uh, here's something we need to embrace. Okay, the early Gentile Christians. Um, were, the Romans didn't really know how to classify them because they weren't really Jewish, but they weren't worshiping the Greek gods and worshiping the emperor anymore. They weren't really Greek. And so the Romans just called them the third race. And the early Gentile Christians embraced that idea. That's yes. right. We're not Jew, we're column. Gentile. We're the third, we're the third race. We're the third people. Yes. It goes back to what Matthew was saying earlier. Yep. Now it's going to manifest yeah. politically. And yes, I think the third that's column. Close. Yeah, I, I think there's some yeah. truth to that, okay? But we have to understand, God's plan is to redeem a remnant from every nation. Is he redeeming a remnant from Israel? Yep. Is he redeeming a remnant from America? Yep, but a remnant, okay? And it is, for a long time, America had a Christian heritage for a long time, and we took it for granted, and we sort of took it for granted that it was there. And so, as a result, most professing Christians in this country cannot decouple their faith from their patriotism. We have to start doing that. Okay, We have to be able to decouple that, not to hate our country, but just be able to look at it squarely, and as Matthew said, look at our leaders squarely and recognize them for who and what they are, what they really represent, not just what they say that makes us feel good, but who they actually are. And recognize, guess what? Okay, if you look at the stats, something like 80, 90% of this country still professes to be Christian. But if you start looking at the who are living it, it's a much smaller number. Okay, there is a lot of pseudo-Christianity going on here. And we have to decouple ourselves from political stance masquerading as faith. See, and that was the trap of America, though. That's the trap of democracy. That I, I've theorized that democracy occurring the way that it has in America is the only way that the world would ever accept an antichrist, actual the person uh, coming up, and because we're going to pick him, we're not just going to go, "Oh God, we've been overrun by this one guy with a magnificent, magnificent personality." Democracy is. Th- humans determining their government and who will rule them and 
And having that power now, they will pick the worst that they can at some point. At some point, democracy is going to be the very thing that ushers in the ability to select this person to run the world. And 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 so well, I, yes I, and no because uh, you sound like one of them communists. You sound like one of them commie bastards over there, Mark. Or ra- <laughs> what? Or rather, Republicanism with is actually the system of government that, that God prescribes. Okay, because God says to people who are like, "I'm going to pick the priests, but you choose for yourselves elders." To represent right. the uh, represent your village, to represent your tribe, and so forth. Okay, so a yeah, uh, not, democracy but, but, is dangerous, uh, but the original Charter of Israel was very similar to a republic. Okay. Yeah, except it was a theocracy. Yeah, yes, with God ultimately in charge. Agreed? Yeah, but there was a time when America was that. I mean, you know, there, you know, yeah. it's America has never been America's, that, and you know it. No, America has, and I'm not saying that to say, hey, look how great we are. I'm saying, look how far we've fallen. It was written into yeah. the United States flag code that the United that the flag of the United States of America will never bow before any earthly sovereign. That's true, and we were consecrated to God of Israel on yes. our in our. So understand, it's not, I'm not okay. saying this as oh look we're we're a special nation. No, I'm saying like Israel of old. You go read First and Second Samuel's. Go read Judges. Go read Kings. Look how far. We have fallen. Forget the political leadership. Look at the common people right. of America. There was a time when we were a Christian nation. Well, forget all the forget all the, forget all the politics up above. Right. There was a time when, if you look at just the American landscape, we were a Christian nation, and we have fallen away from that. And that tragedy. See, the thing is, is bring I, all of us to so fear. I so I can fin- I didn't quite finish what I was trying to get at, I'm and I think this is why. The evil powers behind American imperialism have been trying to push democracy, not republic democracy, but democracy. And we're about to lose the Electoral College in America. Yes. <laughs> and when we about? lose the Electoral College, we cease to be a republic. Oh, I think we've- and, and what's going to well, happen uh- is, is the way that America is poised to be the tool that pushes democracy into countries that are n- not equipped to deal with it. So we force it down as hard as we can so that, of course, on our level, okay, it's a moneymaker. We're trying to do a neocon thing where if these people are democracies, they're not going to find another democracy. I think the power behind that is trying to set up a worldwide system of choice, which is very different from how Islam works now, for instance. It's very different from how China works now. All these different things – Look okay, at what, okay. What, look at what's happening where we're saying, hey, you're a democracy suddenly. Guess what? Are you going to do that in Islamic nations? They choose the hardline Islamists. Yeah. All- democracy is actually dangerous because it gives people their base industry. There's a difference between a democracy and a republic. We're giving right. people democracy, which is you know, a democracy is three lions and a gazelle voting on what's for dinner. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think that was Mark Twain, There's wasn't it? Bit, yeah, exactly. There's a big difference between democracy and republic. We had big in time. this country a de- republic, which is yes, the people choose leadership, but we put deliberate safeguards in place so that you know a simple moment of emotion is not going to throw everything away and it's not going to completely stand. Right. But what we're offering the world, we're now we're going around saying democracy. Yeah. You vote for whatever you want to. Right. Hey, what's happening? Can I- they're voting, voting the most base leadership possible because that's human nature. Well, and they well, knew it would never, ever work. They knew it. They knew it would destabilize destabilize, well, destabilize that region, you know. Can I extenuate my answer for Brandon? Yeah, sorry yeah. for cutting you off, dude. Uh, if you want historical reference as to where we're going, you need to look into uh, the Athenian uh, coup of 411 B.C., that's when the 400 took over. Okay, now if you look at this, uh, that word, ladies and gentlemen, that phrase, the 400, means the uh, elite. Uh, it was coined, of course, uh, in the late 19th century by Ward McAllister uh, in reference to the social elite of New York City. But the 400, in its original context, uh, was the uh, oligarchs uh, that seized control uh, after they overthrew the democratic government. Uh, so, uh, Brandon, if you'd like to know where this is going, 
God's mopped it, uh, mapped it out for you before. Look into those 400 and what happened, and that's where your de- democracy, so to speak, is going to go. Are you talking about a, the Greek democracy, the 400 in the Greek democracy? Yes, it's called – it's the coup that happened in 411 B.C. 400 elite, who you would call Illuminati, took over Athens. Okay, this is – if you look at your history, you look at what happened between, uh, of course, Athens and Sparta. Well, Brandon, you're going to find yourself looking into the news right now. And you're going to see a Donald Trump-like figure. Just look. You will see. You mean back then? Yes. Well, and history repeats itself constantly. Yeah. So, Matthew, are you saying that um, we're t- we transformed from a Republican democracy to like a Greco democracy? Or That's exact. what I'm saying. Okay, let me, let me say it again. Okay. He's going to wait to take the vote until right before we cross the threshold to an invasion, airy attack by a foreign military, not terrorist. It'll be a military invasion. When that happens, the oligarchs that are really behind the scenes, they're going to take over after that event happens. Is that what happened? To mimic, to- it's going to mimic the 400 that ran Athens. Right. I was going to ask you, is that what happened to them? Exactly. Please look it up, ladies and gentlemen. It's- they started the, what they, the, the, they called it the uh, Constitution of the 5,000. Was the new government they created? Is that no, correct? No. That's, that's different. It was called the 400. I'm, okay. I'm reading about how it all went down. And it's not, I mean, you're right. It's We're not, not all at off. once. It happened in phases, okay? No, the, okay. Uh, it's like the Roman Republic, okay? You realize that the trappings of the Roman Republic lasted well into the imperial era. The Senate was still there. The Senate still had real power, okay? The emperor, uh, it, the emperor's power waxed and waned and so forth. Uh, and it basically, you had a big battle between the elites as they tried to expand their own power. And what happened? Uh, the sense of I'm trying to remember what they call them the equestrian class, the uh, you know relatively poor landowners, their freedoms were eroded in favor of the freedoms of the emperor and the senate and the higher ups. Okay, but it didn't happen all at once. It happened over a period of centuries and it went back and forth over a long period of time. But let's face it. Once Julius Caesar declared himself emperor and people fell for it, and then Augustus Caesar followed him. Okay, it wasn't. It, it, it was done. It was just a matter of watching the damage play out. It's, in the same way, in America, we still have the trappings of a republic. Right. That doesn't mean we stopped being. That doesn't mean we didn't suddenly become an empire at a certain point. And we can argue about what that point was. But the fact is that the rule of law got thrown out the window. We are no longer in a country that is ruled by law, where everyone is equal under the law. We are under a country where whoever has the best lawyers win. We might as well just go out and have you know one-on-one combat to sell these things. At least that would be entertaining. You know, we would at least get a good fight out of it. So that we could sit back and say, "Hey, that was a great fight. Watched on TV." But no, it's whoever has the best lawyers and whoever can twist the law and bribe the right officials wins. It has nothing to do with the law being just anymore. Well, that's because we've moved from natural law to political law. Yep. Every one of these has been one small step towards humanism realized in the most satanic way possible. Yeah. Yeah, I, I totally agree with you. It, it, it's always slow step. If you took a giant step, people would recognize it and go, whoa, wait a minute. You can occasionally get away with it for a short period of time. Pardon the Godwin's law, but look at Nazi Germany. Okay, if you have a sufficiently charismatic leader, you can get away with a gigantic shift in a very few years. But it takes a satanically empowered leader to pull that off. Mostly, it happens slowly. The people giving up one freedom after another, step by step, in return for money and protection and everything else. I'm trying to remember which of the founding fathers said those who 
uh, would surrender an essential freedom for a temporary. Uh, it was Franklin deserve Franklin neither. Thank you. Benjamin Franklin. Yeah, those who those would those who would sacrifice an essential freedom for a temporary protection deserve neither. Yes. Well, guess what? That's where we are. Oh man, I want this health care plan. This sounds so wonderful. It says that I can't be turned down for having a bad, uh, you know, ha having some bad health in advance. So uh, I'm going to get behind that and you know figure out how I can milk it and give up all my freedom to control my actual health in the long term. And guess what? You ultimately end up losing the thing that you think you're getting out of the whole bill being allegedly free or inexpensive health care, and you lose the protection you lose that protection and you lose the freedom you had to choose your health care plan before. Now we have panels that will decide if you get the health care that will keep you alive. And that's just one example. I haven't been picking on that one because I'm in the healthcare industry. I know what's going on in the background here. Um, and it is destroying the healthcare industry, it's destroying the small, you know, mom and pop um, doctor's offices and uh, medical equipment and, and so forth in favor of big corporate entities that the government can control better. Okay, I'm just picking on that because I happen to be in the middle of that, but that's not the only example. Now, what's the solution? Guess what? There isn't a simple one. There isn't one that's going to happen in one generation. There's, you can't vote for somebody and get everything back. It's not happening because the vast majority of the American people want to be taken care of rather than want to deal with the struggles that come with freedom and the responsibility that comes with freedom. Let's face it. We're not a culture that embraces responsibility. Okay? The answer is, guess what? We have to stop looking for political solutions. Absolutely. We have to recognize, hey, we had something good here. We sinned. We lost it, just like ancient Israel did. So now we, the remnant, have to recognize that we're not under a democracy. We're not under a republic. We are under a monarchy with one king. We happen to be in exile in this land. And we will, and, but while we are here, we're going to bring as many people into the monarchy of the kingdom of heaven as possible. And but stop working towards and spending our money on and focusing on. I want a political solution that's not going to hurt my pocketbook and will give me all these wonderful freedoms and will get. I'm sorry, you you know, go smoke something. You'll have a better you know a, a better experience. Better than delusion politics. Yeah. I think you just bottom lined it. I mean, you, you can't fix a spiritual problem with a political solution. Yes, thank you. Know, you. you summed it up at. better than I just did. <laughs> that's where we're at, and that's where we've been for a long time. And yeah, it's it's sad, but yeah. Well, what's happened is is that Christians, and this is an area that I specialize in, as far as discipleship goes, is that I spend the vast majority of my time. When I take someone into the discipleship process, and uh, I mean, this is, of course, a lifetime thing, but I, I, I have like a hardcore two years, generally, depending on how the disciple responds. And one of the very first things that I have to do with that person is ingrain them with the thought that we are strangers and aliens, that we do not belong to this world, that we need to decouple from the world. And I'm looking up right now, um, give me just a second, and I'll tell you, there's a book I read in high school, I went to a Christian high school, thank God, that uh, um, uh, it was written by Frankie Schaefer, uh, and it had to do with civil religion. And I want to put the title out there if I can find it. And uh, da, 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 da. it was a long time ago. Um, uh, bum, 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 bum. sorry, I'm, I'm waxing for time here, but, uh, uh, okay, but, uh, but, um, uh, you've got addicted to mediocrity. That's one. And, uh, <clears throat> that's a really good one. And then, uh, but, uh, there's one in particular, uh, that, uh, and I'll find it and I'll get it out there on like my Facebook or something like that. But one of the things that we do is as disciples and disciple makers, because that's the Great Commission, that's what we've been called to do, is we have to, uh, we have to immediately, it's the very first thing, 
we have to get people to stop thinking of themselves as Americans, as Europeans, as Brits, as anything. We have to take away their geographical, political concept of self. That has to be the first thing that goes, because if you cannot get rid of that, you will not be able to for, fully form a disciple who is ready to die for their faith and has no allegiance to this world. And so that is, we can talk about all of this stuff that is so vital to understand and to know, but I truly believe that's where the rubber meets the road as Christian leaders and Johnny, <laughs> um, that what? that's what we have to do is that we, the very first thing we do when we start a discipleship thing with somebody who gets saved is, okay, let me unplug you from the world now. Because that's, that's, and everybody, like you were talking about, there's 90% of people in America who say, oh yeah, I believe in God, but their life is an utter betrayal of that concept. And so you have to look at them and get them to understand being an American is not the same as being a Christian. And even hearing the word being a Christian is not the same as being a disciple. Yes. And Christian. when you, <laughs> yeah, when you can move people through that continuity and then get them into the place where they're like, oh, heaven is home, the earth is training ground, and I need to take as many people with me as possible. When you can get those things achieved, then you really have discipleship in motion. You know, that's, I think, one of the biggest keys, because one of the things that churches have really lost sight of, and not all of them, okay, I've, I've known some really good churches, I've known some really good Messianic synagogues that really focus on this, but this idea of discipleship, um, there's a focus on salvation, getting them in the door, but once you get them in the door, you tend to ignore them to go after the next guy to get them in the door, and it's like, you know, you know, salvation, getting them in the door is good, but we're trying to train them and raise them up so that they can get other people in the door, right? Yeah. You know, so what, instead of just, you know, focusing on getting people just barely in the door, which may not be actually in the door, the fact that somebody says the right words does not magically make them in a part of the kingdom. No, I, I think the parable of the four soils gives truth yeah. to that. Exactly. So we have to refocus on discipleship and going in, and like you said, deprogramming somebody. Okay. Yeah. And unfortunately, most churches are kind of programmed into the America is Christian mindset. Well, that's because and those that's how you are, get... are programmed into the we're the only Christians mindset, which is just as bad. Well, think about it. I mean, if we if we model our churches after the mechanisms of American government, that's how you get the money. Mm -hmm. that's and good so point. and so, I mean, churches. I I run a home church. I am a pastor of a home church. And I sat down with a guy today at lunch. And when I mentioned that to him, he was like, well, what's a home church? And one of the other guys at the table was like, well, it's a church that you do at home instead of going out and wasting a lot of money on a building. And so, you know, the church has to continue to, and I hate to use the word devolve, but we have to return to, and I'm not saying you got to do it at home, I mean, we meet at Panera Bread up the street, too. But we yep. need to be out there as a church with the same mindset in, a, in one accord on the mindset of discipleship and following Christ and surrendering all. I mean, Jesus didn't mince words ever about what it meant to follow him. I mean, I mean, he even looked at the guy and said, well, let the dead bury their dead. Mm -hmm. I mean— and, and dad supposedly wasn't even dead yet. So it, it was just like, if you want life, you take it now. But and Mark. You, and how, you punch out completely. But Mark, how am I supposed to pay for my pastor's gold toilet while I'm living in my trailer? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I guess you'll have to sell some of that trash junk stuff you do with day in, day out. eBay, man. eBay. Okay. eBay will do it. But uh, I mean, I, I think I used to be a full time pastor and a four time rabbi or whatever. Okay. What's you know? that? It would be nice to be able to be a full time rabbi or pastor or whatever. But 
God's got me, it's like when I've prayed about my next steps and, you know, it, it, for those who have been on them for a while, they know that I went through a rough spot last year. Um, but, you know, every time when I've prayed about it and felt like, man, I'm not doing enough here, you know, God's been just like, I've got you where I want you. Okay. And you're learning some things here and you're gaining some resources here that I'm going to put to my use later. And I'm perfectly content at this particular point. It's like, I'm cool with working. I've got my job now, actually, between the job and travel time, I'm working a good 60, you know, on a uh, rough week, 70 hours a week, and then trying to find time to, you know, do the Lord's work in between. But nobody can say I'm doing, uh, I'm doing the Lord's work for the money. <laughs> Yeah, but yeah. the thing is, is that just in what you said right there, and I'm not trying to be critical, uh, is that you have bought into the American paradigm of what it means to be a minister. You uh, are, American paradigm, you are, you like you, the European paradigm. If okay, you want to that's fine. I just think of us all as a bunch of mean white people. Um, <laughs> <laughs> ah. But but what I was getting at was, is you are, and I I had to learn this over a lot of years when I was in the military. You are a full-time rabbi. You are, no matter where you're working, no matter what you're doing, first and foremost, you are a rabbi. For me, I am a pastor of a home church. We get about 12 people or so, depending. And I was talking to the Lord about it, and it wasn't because I wanted to, you know, say the prayer of Jabez and expand my space or whatever. <laughs> but it was one of those things where I was like, Lord, you know, what's the next step? What do you want me to do? Because the pastors I talk to, they're all like, oh, you should have had this many people in this many, you know, you know, before the year was out. And I was like, I'm not doing it like that. I'm not going to do that at all. I'm not even going to declare us as a nonprofit. I want to be able to talk to whoever I want to talk to about whatever I want to talk about. I'm not going to have the government hold me hostage to tax money. So anyhow. My theory was we should all register as nonprofits and then teach in such ways to dare the government to take it away, you know, make them yeah. – Go out and actually take these away and make it public. Yeah, but yeah, we could different. do that. But I mean, if you, uh, we're, we're again, we're we're that's heading down a road where we're we start strategy. talking about, we yeah, start talking strategy. about, well, you know, the church in England and you know, fourteen whatever, and uh, but what I'm getting at is 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 that I know for me, I was sitting there talking to the Lord about it, and and there are times when, besides my own family, we have one person show up. Sometimes. And I talked to the Lord about that. And I says, do you feel like I should be pushing out harder? And he said, Mark, the time will come. And he just told me what to do here recently. But he said that one person that you've got coming, that's all the church he's getting. Mm -hmm. So do not hold back. Give him all the church that he needs. And I thought, well, you know what? Jesus left the 99 sheep that were his to go get the one that was his too. Uh-huh. And I thought to myself, well, that one is worth dying for, so I'll do it. Yeah, and one is all I required, you know, as my justification to do the Iron Show. Just yeah. one. If I could reach one person, everything would yep. be worth it. Yep. Exactly. Yep. I mean, it's like, you know, it's one life. Yeah, but it's one life for eternity. That stretches out quite a bit in terms yeah. of, you know actual worth there yeah. so I, I agree i mean and understand my my thing is um uh, i don't know if you remember or whatever but it's like i was associate rabbi of a relatively small but we're all relatively small messianic synagogue and had a falling out with leadership for a variety of issues i don't want to get into at the moment um uh, but it, it to for a while it felt like sort of all that taken away and then yeah. In the midst of that, you know, it's like it, pretty much as soon as I stopped being really angry over it, the Lord opens up this huge, wonderful, secular career where, honestly, I have to bust hump to keep up with some of these kids. <laughs> I mean, I'll be 40 in about two weeks here. Oh, and, no. Happy yeah. birthday. Yeah, I'm a kid I, compared to some I know, but to me, I'm old. Like Johnny. <laughs> yeah. Compared to Johnny, you're, a, you're an infant. Grandpa exactly. Johnny. But I'm dealing, but understand, most of my life, I've got a lot of coworkers that are in their mid 20s here. So I'm like the old man of the group and all that, and, and I'm struggling, and I feel like sometimes I'm struggling to keep up. And honestly, I enjoy the work. 
it's just that sometimes uh, it's just that it is challenging enough that I sometimes feel inadequate, and so I'm struggling with that, and I'm having to focus so much on it that I'm like, Lord, am I really doing what I'm supposed to be doing? Because I, I feel like I'm focusing all this energy on the secular stuff, and again, God's answer to me is, I have you where I want you. And I've actually come to realize I'm actually in a very blessed place because I'm in a very growing company where the executives actually care a lot about the company culture. And so some of the lessons I missed due to political nonsense with my uh, old organization ministerially, uh, I'm actually learning strangely enough in the secular world in terms of how to build up an organization, how to maintain a culture, how to uh, develop the connections between people and so forth. And again, the Lord's opening of those opportunities. I'm not saying that if I'm not at it full t full time and being paid to do ministry, it's not worth it. I was never getting paid to get, do ministry in the first place. I got a little tiny stipend, which wasn't as much as I put back into it. Um, that's not the point. The point is, sometimes you hit points in your life where you're like, especially if you're really trying to be God-focused, where you're like, man, I, I God, I just don't feel like... I'm doing the right things because somehow all my energies seem to be on this secular stuff. But guess what? The point of the gospel is redeeming sacred space and bringing the sacred into the everyday life. Okay. So when I'm doing a darn good job at what I do, that becomes a witness because I don't hide who I am. Okay. Not everyone gets who I am. But I don't hide who I am, and that ultimately comes witness, like Joseph to Pharaoh. Okay, um, and so there are a lot of people out here who are listening to us, who are like, "Oh man, we're listening to all these huge, big brains on the Iron Show, who you know get to spend like eighty hours a week studying the Scripture and all this stuff." No, 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 guys. Guess what? A lot of us have time crunches too. The point is, none of us are making our living off this. None of us are uh, turning the Bible into a spade with which to dig. God has us all dealing with secular day-to-day -day junk like everyone else, and we're squeezing this in for a few hours on Thursday nights and having a wonderful time doing it because the Spirit is here. And you can too. Okay, I wasn't trying to bring up self-pity. I was trying to say, look, I understand the whole struggle of how do I balance work life with spiritual life and family life and everything else. I, 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 all I was just trying to say to people is, I get that. I get the whole feeling of, man, I'm not doing enough here. And I'm saying, guess what? The Lord has you where he wants you. Your choice is, do you fight it? Or do you go with it and look for all those doors he's opening up? And if you're only there at a particular job to witness to one person... Guess what? If that one person makes it to eternity, you've just gained infinity for one, uh, you know, an infinity right there, then there. Yeah, not only that, but being a, a good mother or father is really all the ministry that yeah. you, most people, are called to. Absolutely. You know. And that's that's not nothing to be sneezed at. No. Absolutely not. Um, my, I've got a teenage daughter. She's in a delicate spiritual position right now, in part because she saw all the crud we went through. Okay, so I, a lot of my withdrawal from a lot of uh, ministerial things has to do with wanting to focus on her, and it's bearing fruit. You know, if I just lead her into the kingdom, hey, hallelujah. <laughs> okay, and it, but big or small. You know, the rabbis have this idea that if you lead someone into the kingdom, if you leave only one person in the kingdom, but that person leads like 100 people in the kingdom, guess what? You don't get credit for just the one, you get credit for the 101. You know, if you're the person that led Billy Graham to the Messiah, then Billy Graham, you know, led a Billy Graham to Christ, you don't get just credit for the one, you get credit for every single person that person ever led to the Messiah. Hey Brian, do you know the story of that guy that um, that old guy that didn't have the guts to like street minister? So he would hand out, stand on the corner in L.A. and hand out um, gospel tracts, and didn't even say a word. And on his deathbed, he was like um, regretting that he hadn't, you know, actually opened his mouth and preached Jesus, but he just handed out his stupid tracts. You know the name of that guy, and one of the kids that he handed the tracts to. Uh, became this huge minister in South America, led millions to Christ, and got a hold of him on his deathbed and told him, look, this is what happened. Do you know who that guy's name is? I do not. Um, you know, I've come across several accounts like that. 
And, you know, I'd have to say at the end of the day, no matter what route went or anybody else for that matter, everything you do should be a shining example. Just when people look upon you, when they have discourse with you, be it even through the Internet and conversations, any single thing can be used to witness the kingdom. There's... So I'd have to say that that guy doing what he did, well, it bore fruit. At the end of the day, that's what matters. Yeah, I mean, I remember Louie told me, the guy who led me to Jesus in my formation, told me God isn't going to be checking your theology at the door. He's going to be looking over the, over your shoulder at the guys that came in behind you. Well, that's I have a lot of... That's not really fair either. Um, because, okay. Here we go. <laughs> <laughs> Here we go. <laughs> because that, that sort of puts the burden to, I've got to sell. Well, not everyone's a seller, okay. Uh, Yeshua himself said, some people sow, some water, some wheat, and some harvest. And so when you say that sort of yep. thing, you make it sound like the only thing that matters is harvesting. Hey, guess what? You may have been the guy who was planting all the seeds that somebody else got the harvest. And you oh. may never have seen those harvests it doesn't mean they're not yours. Hey, you may yes. have been the person who went through weeding because you could, you know, in a conversation, you know, remove an impediment to someone coming to the Messiah. That someone that after that person you talked to had a chance to think about, it, someone later led them to the sinner's prayer. Guess what? You get a credit for that. Okay, you may have been the person that just by being kind and being spirit filled watered a seed. God is the only person that can judge that. So you got to be careful about those positions that make it sound like, oh man, if I don't sell, if I don't get to see the reaping, I'm not doing anything. No. You may never see the actual reaping. It doesn't mean that what you did was important. Oh, uh, yeah. The place to see it is every bit as important as the person who actually you know, goes back behind him with the scythe and reaps it at the end. Oh, yeah, like Getty Lee even. They're, he's going to get credit for me. Because, you know, Rush, when I was a teenager, it's like, wow, there's something more to the world than girls and cars. We're and drugs. Be- and drugs. Don't forget drugs, Johnny. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, there's, there's like... Exactly one thing. Did we do what God called us to do? The end results are up to God. Okay? The end results belong to God. But did you do what he called you to do? That's all. And if he, what he called you to do was to go and work at McDonald's and just be the nicest darn Christian people I've ever met, so a whole bunch of people that came across you weren't able to talk about how hypocritical and mean Christians were because they met this one really nice one, guess what? If you perform that well, you're going to have a great tra- treasure in the world to come. No, of yeah. course you're right. I mean, thanks for well, spelling that out. Expand on, yeah, let go. me expand on this, too. Um I have spent, you know, a great deal of time through one of my hobbies. I talk to people that are all over throughout the world, and I do not 90% of the time bring up my belief, you know, and on down the line, but there always comes that moment the more time I spend with somebody where the conversation comes up and some kind of reply with a bit of shock they didn't see it coming. <laughs> And yeah. it it's just an all together, you know, any circumstance that you're in, if you can find a way just to, well, play nice with others. Yeah. You know, yeah. it's really what brings everything into stark clarity. Oh, yeah. Oh, that's just like the most awesome point really tonight. I, I kind of have an edge on that. I could crack that open because – what I like to do, because it's true, I have both the gift of pastoring and the position, um, is that I'll go somewhere where I might not know people or whatever, and they'll be like, well, what do you do? Well, I, I pastor. And then I act like totally different than all the pastors they've ever run into. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's like, oh, yeah, I'm a pastor. And then all of a sudden they see something that's different. And I'm not trying to say I, you know, I hung the moon, but I know how a pastor's act. Yeah. And I'm like, I'm totally not going to be that guy. I'm going to be the guy who, like, is ready to wash your feet kind of guy. Cool. You know, just kicking back and, 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 and not judgmental and not giving you a hard time if you, 
you know, if you use profanity or anything like that. And I'll tell you what, it was I've had some weird experiences with that pastor thing because uh people it's oh it's so people want a relationship with God so bad and so often they don't know how to do it. I was I was marrying a couple uh and I live in Tennessee and they were down in uh uh, Fort Walton, Florida, and I was going down there, <laughs> and it, and I got there to the house, and there was a bunch of family staying at the house and everything, and you know I get to the door, and I've known this guy, him and I've been really good friends for fifteen years or something, and and, uh, and uh, he yells really loud, ah, the preacher's here, you know, <laughs> and so I'm I'm just laughing about it, but I kid you not, over the course of the next two days, almost everybody came to me on their own when I would sit by myself. So I would go sit by myself and every one of them came by and talked to me about, about their lives. They felt somehow that if they could be held accountable, somehow that they could escape the guilt that they were just living with, that was just in them, that they couldn't run from. And so I was a pastor in those yeah. moments, especially for them. And I was a different kind of pastor than I think any of them were used to dealing with. And and so that difference of our character and the way that we display it is huge. And now I'm going to have to sign off. I have enjoyed the show a ton and I've been the least intelligent person here probably. But but this Don't has been a blast. Yourself, ah, I'm just kidding around. You know I'm stuck up and full of it. <laughs> yeah. um, everybody knows that. Come on, it's Counselor Mark. So anyway... <laughs> I got degrees and stuff. Um, no, that, but, uh, I, I hear what you're saying, though. I mean, it, that is important. I mean, just being nice. Yeah. Can be the greatest witness of all. Yeah. I, I, I really is. I was, I was stationed in Korea, and I remember I had somebody come up to me, and he said, I heard you were a Christian, you and this other guy, Rob. So I heard you guys were Christians. And I was like, yeah, yeah, we are. And he said, I don't believe it. <laughs> and, and I'm kind of like, well, this is not going to turn out well. And, and so I looked at him and I said, well, why is that? And he said, you guys are way too nice. <laughs> yeah, doesn't that and I, suck? And I was just like, oh, that is so horrible. That's what that, I, that, that is just such a, an indictment oh, it is. On, on Christianity and everything. But, hey, uh, love you, Johnny. What's All right, love you too, Council and Mark. Rock. So to everybody who's been on tonight. It was awesome. I loved getting to crack my brain open a little bit and get some stuff in, get some stuff out. And I love everybody that listens. And so we got to do this again real soon. Could you send them yeah. to our new boy on Fringe Radio Network's site for, since he's a big fan of yours, you can send them there. Uh, FringeRadioNetwork.com slash category slash chains. Say it. Hang on just a second here. Let me type all that down. <laughs> Not- <laughs> Well, you know, gotta have to fringe com slash category slash chains. Okay. <laughs> you wouldn't be good at playing that one game with the colored lights. Com slash what? Categories? Category. Does that like C A T E? C A T A? Category? Categories. S- slash chains. Slash chains. Well, is it category or categories? Category. Chains. Slash All right, chains. I got to type now. FringeRadioNetwork.com. That's uh, exists in a real way now. <laughs> so, in my world, see, because I, I believe in, I think, isn't the word solipsism? Where I believe I'm actually the only person who truly exists and you all are figments? Yes. No, you're not. I'm the only person who truly exists. You're just a figment of my imagination. I, oh. uh, I think... With program, dude. I think, yeah, you guys are, I think you guys are actually 90-year-old men, perverts, in gorilla suits. Because I've never uh, met I you in person. I was just going to say, <laughs> welcome you... to the age of the internet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I was wondering if he could smell the itchiness on me. I, I, I was just kind of like, you know... But, I, you know, I I guess I'm speaking pretty clearly through the gorilla mask. I did a screen share with Council Mark one time, and I saw the gorilla hair on his monitor. Oh, there, my gosh. So. I know. Well, it's a mess. I, that's about as 
about as interesting as the uh, test that we did the other night with uh, trying one live video streaming format. And like Knuckleheads, <laughs> we decided to call the video Monkeys. Monkeys. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> that um, John, that I in- have news for you. I, when you saw me in that uh, one video cast, no, I'm not wearing a grill suit. I'm actually that hairy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. I had somebody see my feet one time and said I was a hobbit. <laughs> that's classic oh my gosh what was so funny is is I, I when I had to go to the VA hospital uh, where they were just basically they had processed all my paperwork and I was now a VA disabled patient and all that I had to go get my feet examined uh, uh, just in case I was diabetic and having hairy feet is a sign of really good blood circulation in your feet oh. and it was oh, so weird because I had this I had this one guy, you know, ragging on me saying I look like a hobbit. And then I, I take my shoes off in front of these people and they're like, oh my gosh, your feet are incredible. And it's like, you just don't know where it's going to come from. <laughs> if it's pennies from heaven, just try not to get hit. <laughs> blessed, blessed are the feet of them that preach the gospel. There you go. And blessed are the hairy feet of them that preach the gospel. <laughs> all right, dudes. Love you all. I'll talk to you later. All right, later. Till next Hello. time. Uh, to get a hold of Brian Ingram, he has a new email address. Let me uh, punch this over here. And that would be thebandsoftime at gmail.com. You can ask him all kinds of uh, relevant uh, questions pertaining to world history and current events and their meaning uh, uh, as it lines up with scripture. He's the go-to man for that type of area. Really, uh, Brian Ingram is an expert in world history. He's an expert in um, he's an expert on current events and how they play in, and uh, and really he's 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 a tiny bit of a prophet if you ask me. So um, questions can be directed to the bands of time at gmail.com. That's Brian Ingram, uh, and he's a great guy too. He's like one of my favorite people on earth. And uh, so, uh, Rabbi Mike, we get you at michael.bug, that's two G's, B-U-G-G, bug. That's michael.bug at gmail.com, michael.bug, with two G's, at gmail.com. You can also find my blog at returnofbenjamin.com, and uh, we're planning a launch of a new website soon, but uh, I don't know how soon. <laughs> so just returnbenjamin.com will point you to anything I've written recently, as in the last several years, and my uh, email link is on there if you can't remember my actual name. so Yes, returnofbenjamin.com. He is not Rabbi Mike. He's Rabbi Michael.bug with two Bs. Two See, G's. now people are going to be typing oh, in RabbiMichael.bug. Just Michael.bug. Yes. Right the rabbi part, just Michael.bug at gmail.com and you'll find me. And by the way, for those of you who have written me in the last couple of weeks and are like, man, he's not answered back lately. I'm sorry. Thanksgiving got busy. Yeah, I will get back to all the emails and I'll, I'll get back to you folks. But thank you very much for writing in your patience. Yes, and he's actually even busy at Christmas even though he's a rabbi. Well, I've he's, got Hanukkah, so, you know. <laughs> he's got Hanukkah, but he's also a Christian minister. Yep, so. well, we're actually putting up a tree this year. I, I know that's going to disappoint a lot of people. It's like, eh, my kids want a tree. There's nothing against trees in the Bible, so there you go. We'll have to get together and do another Christmas session, and this time we'll get Matthew Miller and Brian Ingram in there, too. I cool. think that would be well, really let me, cool. Uh, let me point out, two website. Well, a a whole lot of our listeners donated to get my website up and running, and I cool. keep say thank you. So let me state that now. Thank you very much, everybody. You can find uh, my website, which is still being updated. There's things that are going to be put on there. New course at thebandsoftime.com, and we also have a YouTube that's up and running and. Uh, if everything keeps going in the proper direction, we are going to be doing a continuous set of live video casts. So, hoping to get you guys in some night for that too, because it should be a blast. Right nice. on. I'll have to dust off the old camera and put on a gorilla mask. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, well, we got to go with the flat out messing with Sasquatch setup and everything. I mean, man, oh, man. Oh, yeah. So, once again, that's let me give it to you three times. That is thebandsoftime.com. 
That's thebandsoftime.com. Once again, that's thebandsoftime.com. And I assume that if they go there, they'll get links to the video sessions. Ultimately. Yes, well, I'm Ultimately. trying to put up the podcast I've been able to record. I still have to coordinate with Matthew to get the past ones so I can post them to the website as well. Plus, I'm putting the videos in, and I'm in the uh, process, too. I'm going to add in a live um, link on there, so that way when we're streaming live on YouTube, people will be aware of it, or you can just keep an eye on the Bands of Time channel on YouTube. Oh, so it'd be like YouTube.com dot com slash the bands of time i believe so i'm oh. i suppose i could look and not be lazy but you know well you can get there <laughs> you can get there from the bands of time dot com website ultimately you will be able to at least yeah and i'm as far as i understand you can embed live streams so you know basically when a live stream is being done i will just go in and embed the feed itself so you know, there's uh, there's varied areas where people across the world have sometimes difficult accessing, you know, YouTube from a certain portion of the world. Right. So it just kind of makes it easier so that everybody can get to the material. Nonetheless, the archives are also posted, and then I post the archives straight to the website. So a lot of fun, man. I've been, you know, scrambling this entire week to get this whole multimedia set up running in my house doing the video being able to record some decent sounding audio for a change oh it has been a pain but i finally you know there's that point in time where you you know have such a hefty project and then you finally get everything working properly and you have that big smile on your face oh yeah and that's last night once i got everything finally set just the way it had to be i was so so happy Oh, yeah. I know the feeling that happened to me the first decent Iron Show sound several years ago. And yeah, I had been I had been working on it for like 48 hours straight, and I plugged the last thing in and did a check, and I was just like, beaming! <laughs> well, Johnny, here's the cool thing, too. I mean, being that we are both musicians, the amount of um, software that is out there now so you can actually collaborate live um, across the internet with another musician and not have any problems with latency or any of it is literally gotten to the stage of being unbelievable. Even Google Hangouts now has a um, plug-in built in where you can sit there and collaborate live with all your musical stuff running, bringing in your programs, whatever it may be. We can sit there and write songs together now. So, I mean, what has happened... Over the course of the last few years with the internet, um, you know, this technology that's come into place now with Windows 10, it's almost as if they kind of decided to rethink um, how media was going to be presented online. And where with Windows 8, they were starting to kind of close the door to free media being available for, you know, everyday people to be able to put their own material out there. Somebody stepped in and said, "Hey, let's do this thing." So, you know, with that in mind, there's you can definitely get to a spot where you can say we stepped into some some incredible times in those aspects. Yeah, and it reminds me of something that I wanted to say tonight. That it really hit me a few days ago, and uh, kind of in the middle of the night, waking up in the middle of the night, something hits you. You know, and, you know, we had done a study on the Book of Esther, and. Um, you know, I remember Rabbi Mike um, really going off on the um, verse that where um, Mordecai said that told Esther that she, perhaps she had been born for such a time as this, and I think that myself, I just it just it just it, it really hit me kind of like prophetic that you know Rabbi Mike and you and Matthew and I. And, you know, Counselor Mark, it seems like every all the interests and talents that we have have combined into the Iron Show and our other related shows for such a time as this. It's kind of hit me kind of hard. Yep. The Lord brings everything together for his glory. I mean, it's a matter of... 
we have uh, I think the Lord has provided for us to have a very special chemistry here. Yes. And I treasure it every week, even when I'm tired. I mean, I'll, I'll tell you the truth. I was intending to log off at like, you know, 11. <laughs> yeah. And now we're almost to 1 in the morning my time. Uh, oh, no. Just because I, I can tell I'm fighting a cold and all that. But the spiritual refreshment I get out of being here is worth far more than the, you know, a couple hours of lost sleep. Um, and the I Lord agree. is really working to bless not only you know those who who are out there, and we thank you very much for you know putting up with our you know banter and everything else, but also He blesses us by our interactions with each other. So Hallelujah! Yes, and you know anybody anybody well we could take next week off. You want to take next week off and recharge? Uh, let's see here. The the thing of it is, next week is good for me. The week after that is my birthday, and I have no idea what my family is planning for me. So the yes. week the the week of the you know the seventeenth, uh, Sarah and I are actually planning on hanging an office party, and I might be in late anyway, even if I'm going to be there. So let's do if it's up to me, do next week. But the weekend after that, I might be missing. Okay, there we go. So let's just go ahead and plan. We'll do a shorter show next week. We'll try to keep it around an hour. We'll go right into judges. <laughs> that ever happens. Yeah. <laughs> and then the week after that is going to be an iron vacation. So everybody remember that. And with that, I'm going to put these boys to bed. All right. I want to thank, uh, first of all, I want to thank uh, our good friend, uh, the new kid on the Fringe Radio Network, Brandon of Cast em Off Ministries. Uh, archives can be uh, accessed. His podcast can be accessed on iTunes on the Fringe Radio Network feed and at fringeradionetwork.com slash category slash chains. Uh, his, uh, his reach out, um, take your guilt, take your shame, take your depression and all your pain and cast them off. Breaking the chains. The chain breaker himself, Brandon Schwinn of Cast Them Off Ministries. That's fringeradionetwork.com slash category slash chains. Of course, uh, uh, past archives of the Iron Show Live can be accessed at fringeradionetwork.com slash category slash iron. I want to thank Brian Ingram, Matthew Miller, Rabbi Mike, and Mark Breton for hanging out with us tonight. Thank Dr. Future and Peter Goodgame for in- early inspiration. I want to thank producer Rick, and most uh, importantly, Bruce Collins. The Iron Show is on the Fringe Radio Network at the behest of Bruce Collins. All right, till next time. Good night, everybody. Johnny loves you. Oh, yeah!